evening, members of staff. Also, good evening and anyone from the public that are joining us this evening on Wednesday, May the 12th, Electronic Meeting of Council. Welcome all. And I will now call the meeting to order and start with their council commitment. So a council commitment for the town of Penetanguishin. We are grateful for the many gifts which have been bestowed on Penetanguishin and its citizens, including the gifts of freedom, opportunity, and peace that we enjoy. May we be worthy custodians of all that has been entrusted to us. We ask that all in attendance and those who could not be here assist us in promoting good government. May our decisions as members of council be enlightened and may we all be strengthened in our awareness of our duties and responsibilities. May we be granted the wisdom, knowledge, will and understanding to preserve the good fortune of the town for the benefit of all and to make good laws and wise decisions. Thank you all for attending. And with that, I will move on to four, which is the approval of the agenda. And with, I would ask that I have a mover and a seconder that the agenda for the regular council meeting of May 12, 2021 be approved as presented. Councillor LaRose and Councillor Mayotte, all in favor? Thank you. Declaration of pecuniary interest, if anyone so has, they may declare or declare at the appropriate time. Deputations and presentations, we have none. Adoptions of minutes not already confirmed. Minutes that the following minutes of council meetings be confirmed and adopted as circulated. Special Council, May, March 24, 21. Council, April 14, 2021. And Special Council, April 26, 2021. Mover and a seconder. Councillor Cummings and Councillor Levy, are there any questions or concerns uh, in regards to these minutes? If not, all in favor. That is carried, thank you. Consent agenda, there is none. We move on to nine, which are matters for consideration. And under uh, that, we will have uh, a verbal update from the Chief Administrative Officer vis-a-vis uh, -vis the municipal impacts uh, from COVID. And so with that, Mr. CAO, if you would, please. Thank you, Mayor LaRue. Um, as Council will recall, uh, we've, uh, we were providing the verbal updates uh, at our monthly meetings uh, in an effort to keep Council as well as the public apprised of any updates as it relates to COVID-19. So a couple updates I wanted to provide uh, Council and the public on are, are with respect to the stay at home order. Uh, as everyone knows, that was issued by the province in early April. It does currently extend through to May 19th. Uh, with some speculation that it that it uh, very well might be extended uh, into uh, into next month into June. With respect to the town uh, municipal offices, we do remain closed to the public operating by appointment only. It seems to be working quite well and we appreciate uh, the public's cooperation. Uh, the public has been very understanding and and I believe has really leveraged uh, the virtual and electronic, and, and alternative means to uh, obtain services. With respect to uh, an update I provided a month ago, uh, dog tags and fire permits continue to be suspended as a result of the stay-at-home order. Uh, we did extend, as Council will recall, uh, will recall uh, the penalty, uh, waiving of the penalty on the second interim tax installment that was due April 30th. And we extended it to be seven days or one week following uh, the point in time in which the stay at home order is lifted. Yeah. So that stay at home order, uh, assuming it gets extended, the, the need uh, or the, the penalty application on the second installment of taxes will also, of course, be extended. Uh, the same can be said for the utility bills uh, with, that have a due date of May 13th, uh, which is tomorrow uh, again. Uh, given that the original stay at home order was actually uh, early May, uh, we have, we're taking a similar approach and, and uh, extending that just for the penalty component of it to seven days beyond uh, when the stay at home order gets lifted. With respect to a variety of 
municipal services that are provided. And uh, first I'll talk about outdoor amenities. So a number of outdoor amenities uh, are or, or do continue to be closed uh, until further notice. So multi-use sports fields, sports facilities, et cetera. So baseball, diamond, soccer fields, tennis, bocce ball, et cetera, uh, do continue to be closed. Um, one of the things that we are, staff have started turning their minds to is starting to uh, get ready and get prepared uh, as best as we can uh, in anticipation that at some point in the near future, we hope and expect that the province uh, does ease some restrictions in that regard. So uh, really just trying to plan ahead as best as we can, recognizing that there are some things that, uh, that we may need to wait for the specific regulations on. The other service I want to talk a little bit about is the boat launch and the wharf. Uh, so we, as I indicated a month ago, we are pleased to have our Harbour Master back on board. I'm uh, very excited to have Kurt uh, back with us for another season and certainly the staff as well that, uh, that assist Kurt uh, at, that, uh, at that location. So recreational boating is not permitted under the current uh, emergency and stay at home orders. Uh, boats belonging to the seasonal boaters must remain secured at the town dock. Unless, of course, they're traveling to another property that they own out on Georgian Bay, for example. This, is a, this approach is consistent with our neighbors in North Simcoe. And certainly uh, the control group is keeping a keen eye and close eye on the situation. Uh, there's a lot of education happening now that it is, this, it is a, uh, the location is staffed by municipal employees. And certainly, as I said, keeping a keen eye on, on that. With respect to um, kind of the provincial and Simcoe Muskoka update, as the public and as members of council uh, will know, April 30th and May 1st, there was a uh, education and enforcement initiative initiated by the Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills Development uh, that happened in Simcoe Muskoka with the assistance of public health, uh, municipal bylaw, as well as uh, our local police. Um, and the update that came out today from Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit indicated a very positive compliance rate in Simcoe Muskoka of 70%. So Simcoe, the public health was certainly very happy with that compliance. I think there were a total of four POA Provincial Offenses Act notices issued uh, as a result of that two-day blitz, uh, three of which were issued by, uh, by public health themselves. In Penetang Machine, uh, our bylaw did assist uh, public health and the ministry with the blitz. And again, very positive, uh, a very positive uh, uh, two day uh, experience. As council and the public recalls, we do have a vaccination clinic in Penetang Machine operating um, roughly once a month. In terms of eligibility uh, over the next uh, couple, uh, couple weeks, I should say, uh, the eligibility is opening up uh, quite rapidly in terms of age groups. Uh, and so, for example, this week, uh, those 40, 40 and over, uh, as or those and or those with uh, that are at risk with health conditions, as well as the group two of the essential uh, of the essential workers open up this week. Next week, those turning 30 or older uh, in 2021 open up and the following week, those turning 18 uh, uh, or older open up uh, as well. Just the last couple concluding comments is that the emergency control group does continue to meet on a biweekly basis. Uh, if there's a need to meet more frequently, we do. Um, and certainly uh, do push out weekly communication to the public uh, in, in that regard. Certainly we're keeping a keen eye on any changes that might happen with respect to the stay at home order and or lifting of outdoor sports facilities, for example. Um, and certainly we'll obviously communicate that to, uh, to the public uh, in, in as fast of an order as possible. I think just the general message that I wanna articulate is, while there does appear to be some optimis optimism with respect to numbers, I think it's important that we do stay the course and that you know we do want to avoid at all costs a potential fourth wave, uh, recognizing that um, you know there are uh, there are a number of uh, anticipated changes that we might see from the province in the coming weeks. Um, so, Mr. Mayor, with that, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions 
or comments from members of council. Very good. Thank you, Mr. CAO. Uh, members of council, do we have any concerns or questions uh, of the CAO? Uh, Councillor Vladimir. Thank you, Worship. I appreciate the update. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lees. Um, I appreciate also that we're um, starting the planning for outdoor activities uh, pending any announcements from the province. That's, uh, that's great. It's good to be prepared. My question has to do with the reopening of the office to the public and what plans are we making for that? Um, if you could just uh, advise us on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Councillor Vadabancourt. Um, when, when this was discussed at our last emergency control group, what we, where we left, uh, left it was that we wanted to, uh, we really wanted to wait to see when the province anticipates lifting the stay at home order. So timing with respect to the province lifting that as well as uh, wanting to ensure that, you know, we are uh, consistent with, uh, with what's happening in, uh, in North Simcoe, uh, I think are probably two factors that we want to certainly keep a very keen eye on. Uh, the other thing I would say is, you know, we, we really just want to ensure that, you know, when, uh, when we look to open, we're doing so in a responsible manner, uh, recognizing that, you know, at the end of the day, the safety of staff and the safety of the public is really uh, the, the top priority. So I, I don't have a, a, a defined date in terms of when we expect to open, uh, open the office, but I think sufficient to say through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, that uh, it is definitely an item that uh, the control group uh, we'll be discussing as we uh, as we start to see the province making some changes uh, to the to the regulations. Thank you. Further questions, concerns? There being none, uh, all in favor. Sorry, Your Worship, we don't have a Mr. mover or seconder. Tonight, I received for information. That's correct. Yeah, for information only. Okay. So we move on then to presentation considerations of report of sorry. committee of the whole. Sorry to interrupt. Yes. Sorry to interrupt your worship. We do need the, the motion to, to be received for information and a mover and a seconder. That's what I was looking for. Councillor uh, Sainema and Deputy Mayor, all in favor. Thank you. Presentation and consideration of report committee of the whole. Committee of the whole report. April 14, 2021, that the recommendations contained within the committee of the whole report related to the recreation and community service sections be approved. Uh, moved by Councillor Cummings, seconded by Deputy Mayor Dubo. Are there any questions or concerns, comments? None, all in favor. Thank you. Moving on to the recommendations contained within committee of the whole report related to the planning and development services section be approved. Moved by Councillor Levy and seconded by Councillor Budebonker. Questions, concerns, or comments? All in favor? That is carried, thank you. That the recommendation contained within committee of the whole report related to the transportation environmental service section be approved. Moved by Councillor Clue, seconded by Councillor LaRose. Questions, comments, concerns? There being none, all in favor? That is carried, thank you. And finally, that the recommendations contained within the committee of the whole report related to the finance and corporate services section be approved. Uh, moved by Councillor Sainama and seconded by Councillor Mayat. Uh, any comments, concerns? There uh, being none, all in favor? And that is scary, thank you. We now move on to 11, which is motions of which notice has previously been given. There are none. Moving to 12, notices of motion. There also, there are none. We now move on to consideration of bylaws. And that the Council of the Town of Penetanguishene introduced the following bylaws 2021-24. Being a bylaw to amend the zoning bylaws 2000-02 as amended of the Corporation of the Town of Penetanguishene, 
77 Fox Street. 2021-25 being a bylaw to set the rate of taxation for the year 2021. 2021-26 being a bylaw to adopt the budget estimates of all sums required for the year 2021. 2021-27 being a bylaw to authorize the entry into an agreement with the Southern Georgia Bay Chamber of Commerce for the provision of office space for the 2021 season. 2021-28 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of agreement with Dr. Jose Echeverri, York University for the operation of the Ecology Garden at 144 Fox Street, Penetangosheen, agreement to follow. 2021-29 being a bylaw to authorize the entering into an agreement with Sod Rocks Chemicals Limited for the supply of aluminum sulfate for the wastewater treatment process. 2021-30 being a bylaw to authorize the entering into an agreement with Serati and Partners for the supply of geotechnical engineering services and quality assurance testing. And finally, 2021-31, being a bylaw to amend bylaw 2011-61, being a bylaw to authorize the execution of an agreement with Rogers Communications for the installation of a transmission antenna on the Centennial Water Tower. So our clerk has been a busy lady. Uh, with that, uh, could I have a mover and a seconder that the Council of John Appendix Sangusheen introduce the following bylaws? Uh, Councilor Evey and Councilor Vredebonker, and all in favor. That is carried, thank you. Now we go to question period from media and the public. I don't know that we have anyone. Doesn't appear. Moving on to 15, which is announcements and inquiries. Do anyone uh, of members of council have announcements or inquiries? Councilor Mayat. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. An inquiry, I guess, is just, I don't know if this is when they'll bring it up, but if we can get an update at the next meeting for 59 uh, Main Street in Penetanguishing. Uh, like a lot of people are asking questions, and I figured, you know, if we could just bring an update, bring staff up to date, or uh, staff and council and the public up to date. What's happening there, if it's possible? What I, what I, what I might suggest, Council Mayette, I know what you're talking about. What I might suggest is uh, when we get to our uh, committee the whole meeting under planning that we might want to add it to the referral. Okay, we can do that too. Thank you. Okay. Uh, say any other announcements or inquiries? Okay, there being none, uh, we go to the confirmation bylaw and that confirmation bylaw 2021-32 be signed, sealed uh, by the mayor and the clerk, mover and the seconder. Your worship. Your Worship? Yes. I believe Councillor Clue uh, had a, her card up to speak. Well, I'm sorry about that, Councillor Clue. I guess I miss you. Go it's ahead. okay. I'll, I'll flag you down next time. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just a couple uh, quick announcements. I uh, didn't want to forget that it is Museum Month in the month of May. And our Penetanguishing Centennial Museum has been very active on social media despite being closed to the public. So just a reminder to everyone to check them out on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, wherever you like to get your feed. And the second thing I wanted to mention also is that we do have so many healthcare heroes in the area and this week is Nurses Week. So yes. we would be remiss to forget our wonderful nurses. So thank you absolutely. to them. Absolutely, very well. Uh, okay, and so then with that, if I, there is no one else, uh, I don't see any yellow cards there. So uh, that the confirmation bylaw 21-32 be signed and sealed by the mayor and clerk, mover and a seconder, uh, Councillor Cummings and Councillor LaRose, all in favor, uh, carry. And uh, Councillor Cummings, move to adjourn. Thank you. Our meeting, the regular council meeting is adjourned. So. With that, we will now move into our Committee of the Whole and call the meeting to order and ask for approval of the agenda, the recommended action that the Committee of the Whole agenda for May 12, 2021 be approved as presented. Mover and a second. Councillor LaRose and Councillor Mayotte, all in favor. 
that is carried. Again, declaration of pecuniary interest, if anyone so has, they may so do now or at the appropriate time. Uh, presentations and delegations, all sections. So we do have a few presentations tonight. And our first one, a presentation and, uh, is from uh, the Chief Administrative Officer V. Future of 51 Dunlop Street. So Mr. CAO, if you would, please. Thank you, Worship. Um, we have a presentation that was included in the agenda package that uh, I believe Sarah is going to uh, start to share in a moment. And there it is. Uh, thank you, Sarah. All right. And so this presentation really is uh, an opportunity to uh, to articulate and share uh, in a little easier format uh, the information that's provided a little later this evening in the committee uh, in the finance and corporate services uh, component of, uh, of this agenda under committee the whole. So we'll, we'll move on to the next slide and, and really as I said the goal of this is to present uh, information and options with a staff recommendation as it relates to uh, 51 Dunlop, the former PSS uh, school. So in terms of the outline or the summary for the presentation, I'm gonna give a little bit of a background with respect to the history and how we've got to where we are today. I'm gonna speak a little bit about uh, when and why and uh, when and why we, we essentially uh, resolved into in camera with council. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the building condition and environmental site assessments that uh, have been conducted on the site and on the facility, as well as uh, speak to some options and ultimately a summary recommendation uh, that uh, the report uh, presents a little later on in the agenda. So we'll move on to the next slide. And the next slide talks a little bit about the purchase background and the history. There's a lot of information here, so I'm going to try and uh, highlight the key points. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, the former PSS school at 51 Dunlop Street officially closed its doors in June of 2016. Uh, subsequent to that, it was being used a little bit for continuing education and adult learning center, as well as the sports field on a temporary basis. In January of 2020, the town became aware that the board uh, released an intent to dispose of the surplus property. Uh, fast forward about eight months uh, at, a, at a special in-camera meeting of council. Uh, council was informed that um, through the priority sequence as outlined in the Ontario regulation, that uh, it was unable to solidify a deal with the higher priority entity and was subsequently moving on to the town of Penetanguishim uh, in terms of the priority list. Uh, last October, uh, council was provided with a formal appraisal uh, along with a number of other facility and structural assessments uh, that you'll see a little later on in the agenda. Uh, in December, on Christmas Eve, um, it, uh, we were successful in uh, signing and finalizing a purchase and sale agreement um, in the amount of 1.295 million inclusive of HST. And we pushed out some communication in January to that effect. And we ultimately had 120 days to satisfy some conditions as part of the purchase and sale agreement. And on April 22nd, uh, last month, uh, following council direction, uh, we did formally satisfy all the conditions and ultimately made the deal firm and final. If we move on to the next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit about open and closed meetings. So there were a number of uh, five to be exact, five meetings that council met in camera uh, to discuss the potential purchase of the property. The Municipal Act, as well as our, our own town procedure by law does allow for uh, a meeting or a part of a meeting to be closed to the public, uh, particularly in this case, as a result of discussing uh, pending acquisition of land. Um, in part, uh, the discussion was held in camera, given uh, the potential impact to the Simcoe County District School Board, uh, had the town and the school board not successfully entered into an agreement, and certainly uh, did not want to impact the board's potential ability to sell to another buyer. So I've listed the five meeting dates uh, that, that council met in camera. 
Um, and uh, in addition to that, there was at the request of Burkeville, the Burkeville Protestant School Board, uh, the mayor, as well as myself, uh, attended a meeting with, uh, with the board, the Burkeville Protestant School Board, alongside our local MPP, Jill Dunlop, uh, to discuss their current location and some potential needs that they currently have. If we move on to the next slide, um, you know, over the last several months, particularly since we've pushed out uh, communication to the public, we have received a number of inquiries and feedback uh, from members of the public and from members of the community and from, you know, some community groups. And it's very clear to us as staff and certainly to, to council, I believe, that there are a number of emotional and sentimental connections to the, to the building, uh, particularly given uh, the, the prior use, which was the Penetanguishan Secondary School as a, as a high school. In addition to those groups, uh, we've had uh, groups reach out asking about you know, potential partnership opportunities to occupy space, et cetera. And specifically I've listed there, um, the Burkeville Protestant Separate School had reached out. We had a, a citizen who belongs to the Georgian Bay Métis Council uh, reach out and provide some feedback. <clears throat> Again, uh, a citizen of, uh, of, the, of the Georgian Bay Métis Council, so not, not a member of the council as I understand, um, but certainly an interested uh, resident in North Simcoe. As well as we did have a group of doctors that was uh, kind of potentially doing some information gathering uh, and had uh, asked for some information with respect to what was happening and uh, you know at that site. If we move on to the next slide, uh, there's a lot of information on this slide and, and it really talks about the property and the building as we know it. Uh, we know that from a land use planning perspective, uh, the property does have 171 meters of frontage onto Dunlop Street. Uh, the total site is just under 14 acres. Uh, it has potential access being through Goche Drive and Edward Street. Um, when we look at the provincial policy plans, uh, we know that it identifies uh, that, uh, you know, to provide for appropriate development while protecting resources of pro provincial interest, public health and safety, and the quality of the natural and built environment. If I move down, and I'm not going to read word for word because I think everyone hopefully has had an opportunity to look at it. If I look at our official plan in Penetanguishene, that's a 2019 document, it is designated as a neighborhood area on Schedule A. Um, as well as the property is identified as a future study area, which I talk a little bit about in the staff report. The property zoned institutional zone G, which permits a number of uses, uh, being a cemetery, a church, an institution, a college, public uses, public parks, a sanatorium, a wildlife preserve, a hospital, a school, a museum, and a home for the age. So quite, uh, quite uh, open, quite broad um, under, under that zone G. And the last thing I would just mention is that, you know, clearly the OP as well as our zoning bylaw did envision uh, the town taking an active role in future land uses of the school site, uh, should it be surplus uh, to the Simcoe County District School Board. So if we move on to the next slide, um, one of the components or one of the um, uh, future information gathering that we did in our due diligence phase with the purchase and sale agreement was to have an environmental site assessment uh, conducted. So both a phase one and a phase two on this particular property. So we did retain a third party EXP to complete that uh, on behalf of the municipality, uh, which ultimately uh, involved an analysis of the current and previous land uses on the site, as well as any historical information related to the site. The bullet points there, and I'm just going to kind of summarize, ultimately there were four boreholes that were, that were conducted on the site, uh, ranging in depths anywhere from 8 meters to 46 meters. A number of soil samples were taken, a number of groundwater samples were taken. With the groundwater samples, all the lab results uh, for the various parameters were either not detected or were below the table two um, uh, limits with the exception of one component, uh, which tested above uh, the particular limits. 
the other kind of the last piece there, the last bullet point, there, there was no evidence of free products of visible sheen or film or odor uh, that was observed during the groundwater and soil sampling that was on site. And ultimately in, in conclusion, I guess, uh, based on the results of the phase two ESA, uh, our third party or EXP as I identified concluded that there were no further uh, environmental investigation that was required uh, as a result of the, of the uh, concluding uh, or the conclusion of the report. So good news in terms of uh, going through the, the phase one and phase two ESA. If we move on to the next slide, as, a, as part of the process of, of exploring the potential, uh, the potential purchase or acquisition of this property, we did receive a number of documents from the Simcoe County District School Board, uh, several quite uh, lengthy documents that you'll notice are appended to the staff report. Uh, one of them, uh, which was a pretty key document, was a building condition assessment that was completed in early 2012 uh, on behalf of the school board. We did a number of site inspections and certainly, you know, we had engaged our third party appraiser uh, as well as uh, in-house uh, uh, professional staff. And, and while the, the building and the facility looked to be in relatively good condition, it was pretty clear when you start looking at the building condition assessment, as well as the supporting documents that, that really, really and truly, the building needs quite extensive work over the next uh, five to 10 years. So in particular, uh, you know, one of the documents the school board produced was, uh, was an overarching summary document that identified the cost to address renewal projects needed at the school over the next five and 10 years uh, so over a 10 year period, uh, so the first five years was a little over 14 million. And then the additional uh, five years was a little under 15 million. So a little under 29 million over the next 10 years of work that would be required. There is some conflicting information uh, in other documents they provided um, that suggests the number might be a bit less than that, more in the you know, shy of 20 million range over the next kind of 10 to 12 years. But suffice to say that there is extensive work that is required uh, at the facility to maintain it in good working, uh, good working order, but also to comply with building code and accessibility regulations, et cetera. One of the other documents that we received was an asbestos content report. Very clear that there, the building does have a substantial amount of asbestos in it. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the, in the next uh, couple slides. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, we also received a roof inspection report from 2012 that does suggest that half of the school roof uh, and roof apparatuses are in fair, uh, poor to fair condition. And the other half is, is identified to be in good condition. So the takeaway from the roof inspection report is that the portions of the roof that are in, for, in poor to fair condition would require a little under $1.5 million worth of work uh, between 2014 and 2028. So fast forward, we're in 2021 today. And uh, obviously in the last seven years, there hasn't been, uh, hasn't been any substantial work completed on the roof. Um, so certainly uh, a key component of the facility that, that again would require a, a number, you know, pretty substantial work uh, to, to keep it in good working order. If we move forward to the next, next slide, uh, one of the things that was identified through uh, having some professionals, um, you know, do some investigative work for the municipality throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, purchase process was to, was to look at the type of asbestos containing materials and, and the quantity in the subject building. So while, while the you know that review identified that the type of uh, the type of what I'm going to call ACMs or asbestos containing materials were certainly typical for a building in uh, of that vintage, the quantity or the extent of ACMs was not typical. A substantial amount of asbestos containing materials uh, are identified or have been identified in the in the block walls, uh, which are identified to be coated with the ACMs. Uh, as well as structural columns are insulated. 
Uh, we know that there's a number of other areas as well, including uh, drywall uh, being identified as to contain asbestos. One of the things that, uh, you know, one, one, this would be one of the pieces, of course, that, that the council would want to consider through the options that have been presented. So if we move to the next slide, in the next three slides, I'm going to walk, I'm going to walk the committee and, and, and the public through three options that we've been, that we've provided to committee for consideration. So option one is demolition and asbestos abatement. Um, ultimately, under this option, the building would be, uh, would be demolished with a full and complete asbestos abatement. This option is, is the option that's, that staff is recommending. Uh, careful consideration was given when, when making a staff recommendation. A number of factors that, that uh, were considered and taken into account, of course, including the sentimental value of the building and the close connections that, that the building has to a number of, of uh, individuals in the community. So there's really three reasons that led administration to this uh, recommendation. Uh, one of which was there really is no known projected use for the building that's been identified as being financially sustainable for the municipality, which I think is important uh, for committee to, and, and important for the community as well. It does require significant capital requirements over the next 10 to 35 years. We know that for certain, uh, that certainly from staff's perspective is not sustainable for the municipality based on what we know today. And the last piece is the liability. So there is uh, some financial as well as legal liability. Financial I've already spoke to um, as a result of having the building operational and utilized under some sort of a landlord potential tenant relationship, if that's the route that, that committee or council ended up wanting to go. Under this option, we do anticipate the demolition and asbestos abatement, as well as some additional kind of um, lead up and, and concluding works um, that would be required to be less than one and $1.5 million. So of course this number would be validated through a procurement process, um, but we do anticipate based on what we know today that everything, um, everything all in to get the building down to slab on grade, as well as any final site works would be, uh, would be less than 1.5 million to be validated through a procurement process if that's the way committee wishes to go. So if we move to, to the next slide, option two that's being provided is exploring facility use options. So under this option, uh, council, would, uh, council could consider giving administration direction to explore potential facility use opportunities with community groups and or organizations. Um, under this option, there is some work that would need to be done. Um, and I talk about that in kind of the second paragraph there, but ultimately staff would recommend getting an updated building condition assessment. Uh, the last one was a 2012 document um, and things may have changed and, and numbers may not have been indexed, uh, particularly for today's dollars uh, from a construction perspective. We would recommend engaging an architect to do a further review for any Ontario building code or other statutory requirements that might be uh, required as a potential change of use. And uh, further, we would suggest consideration be given to what role the municipality plays in any potential landlord tenant relationship, recognizing that there may be opportunity and, and may make uh, financial sense to hire a third party to manage that potential landlord tenant relationship, uh, folks with the appropriate expertise. This option is not being recommended by staff, primarily due to the financial reasons. Financial sustainability is, is a main pillar in our strategic plan. Um, and certainly uh, from a staff perspective, uh, couldn't support making a recommendation uh, given the, the quantitative um, as well as qualitative, so operational matters that we noted that uh, we know currently exist with the building. If committee and ultimately council wish to proceed with this option, there would be, as I identified before, there is still uh, you know, a number of things that we would recommend need to be done, but we would estimate that this work would range anywhere from 150 to $200,000 to retain the appropriate outside consulting uh, or third-party services. 
If we move to the next slide, this is the third and last option that staff have provided to committee uh, for consideration. And under this option, the municipality would look to sell the property either in whole or in part to any interested groups or organizations or individuals. In the report, I do talk about, you know, that there, there may be potential to uh, uh, sever or, or keep a component of the property. Um, but certainly, you know, that option is always available. I've provided some information there with respect to um, an old, uh, an older plan of subdivision that currently exists on, on the property. Um, but that's really just provided for information. And it's not to suggest uh, that that would need to be the, the route if, uh, you know, if, the, if the property was or if committee and council decide to sell. It's not to suggest that it would have to have to go through that, go down that path in terms of uh, developing it into residential uh, residential units. This option is not being recommended given the intent of the property purchase, uh, which was really identified to be for strategic uses for the benefit of the community in the future. So again, uh, the, the current aging asset from our perspective won't provide a long lasting benefit without significant and unsustainable uh, financial attention put towards it. So if we move to the next slide, uh, I identify and outline kind of the project timeline and steps under the recommended option, uh, option one, which is steps one through four on the slide uh, on the right hand side would take somewhere between 12 and 16 weeks or three to four months uh, with the uh, final demolition and asbestos abatement taking an additional six to eight months. So it seems like a long period of time. And, and I'm sure that when you look at this slide, you kind of sit back a little bit and, and think that, you know, that it's, it's a significant amount of time. Um, but certainly this is, uh, this is meant to give as accurate of a picture and as real of a picture for committee and council and the public as we possibly can. Uh, it's based on a number of um, kind of exploratory work that staff have conducted and, and had conversations with. If we look to our neighbors in Midland, uh, that demolition and asbestos abatement uh, took nine months. Uh, larger building, uh, of course, and, and different factors at play, um, but certainly, um, certainly just gives some perspective. We know of another demolition, for example, in Aurelia that took, I think, about five months, and the building was of similar size. So I guess what I'm saying is, it, could, it be, could it be completed quicker if all the stars align? I think the answer is possibly, uh, but we did want to build in like any uh, any lengthy and project that that may have uh, unknowns. We did want to build in a little bit of a contingency uh, in an attempt to you know account for the unknown, um, and certainly didn't want to overpromise and underdeliver. If we move to the next slide, uh, I talk a little bit about. Uh, what, what we were able to, uh, what staff was able to garner in terms of potential demolition costs and asbestos abatement costs. In a prior report, uh, I had identified uh, that we, we had estimated the range being anywhere from 10 to $15 per square foot. Uh, it's a 100,000 square foot building or a little shy of that, I should say. So the range was really, you know, from 980,000 to say 1.47 million, but under one and a half million. So based on the information we know today, we do anticipate that we will be within that upper threshold of 1.47 million, um, but certainly, you know, again, would get some pretty firm assurance when we go through, uh, go through the competitive procurement process, if that's the way committee and council wish to go. If we move forward to the next slide, I talk a little bit about some potential next steps outside of the procurement process. So one of them is um, we recognize the sentimental and emotional um, value this building has. So one of the things that we've uh, identified in the staff report, and of course, contingent on public health regulations and public health recommendations uh, as a result of the pandemic, but really trying to give the public and the community an opportunity uh, to have potential access to the building before, uh, before any substantial work is completed, uh, whatever option committee and council choose. So we, we see a desirable outcome 
being to engage the community and, and have them uh, give them an opportunity to get involved, hopefully give them an opportunity uh, to receive a little bit of closure as well if option one is where council heads. Ultimately wanting to give the community an opportunity to potentially own or harvest a piece of, of their memories with that building. The middle component of this slide talks a little bit about temporary building use. Uh, we are going to be pushing out in the next day or two, uh, some communication to the public that identifies we will be entering or we, we will be entering into a short term use agreement with the school board uh, to leverage and utilize two classrooms as well as some wash, washrooms uh, for, the, for the benefit of our roads division staff, as well as some parking that, that are, that's needed. So as a result of the pandemic, we've split our, our departments into two teams and the roads division is no different. And this was really an opportunity given, given the process and given the purchase to uh, enter into this agreement with the school board. The last uh, piece that I just want to mention is, regardless of which option is chosen, I think committee and council and the public uh, ought to be uh, cognizant and aware of the short-term financial uh, operating costs that, uh, that come with that building. And based on the use of the building over the last uh, five years, uh, we, had, we estimate that the the operating costs would be anywhere from 100 to 150 thousand dollars, and again, the use has been, you know, it's not been entirely vacant, so there has been some use and some utilities and some hydro, uh, but it just gives a little bit of a picture based on the limited use that has occurred at that building uh, over the last five years. If we move forward um, to the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about future opportunities. If we just uh, moved on to the next slide. And one of the things that, you know, really drove staff's uh, recommendation and, and ultimately staff bringing this forward originally to council and, and ultimately I think council's decision to purchase was our 2019 to 2023 strategic plan. So it really provides a comprehensive view of, of the community's vision and priorities and what we aim to accomplish over the next five years. You'll see at the bottom there pretty extensive uh, information provided by the public as well as staff and council through this process in uh, 2018, 2019. And again, a lot of that, and I'll touch a little, I'll get a little more in depth on the coming slides. The next slide just talks about some potential possible visions of the property uh, moving forward. And, and uh, one of them, you know, and, and there's five potential visions that staff have identified, but again, you know, prior to uh, making any long-term decision with respect to the property, if committee and council choose to go the demolition and asbestos abatement route, staff would recommend thorough consultation and engagement with the community, um, you know, to really make sure that the community has a voice, has an opportunity to get engaged and consult and provide information to council and the municipality with respect to next steps. So one potential opportunity is uh, the future site of, of, of a possible arena and community center. Um, as everyone knows, we do currently have an arena and recreation center study uh, underway. Uh, the draft report is anticipated to come to council um, on June 9th, uh, which will really provide uh, options and a recommendation to council uh, from our third party MB planning consultants uh, with respect to to where, uh, what that study found. One component of the study is a location analysis. So it, it does include uh, the subject site um, at 51 Dunlop Street as a potential opportunity. Uh, and this conversation has been happening since 2014 through the town's recreation master plan. It, uh, it was very clear in there that consideration should be given to this site uh, for future recreation purposes. Through that conversation with MB, there's also, it, it's been very clear that, you know, if council does choose uh, to build new and, and the other if is if the subject location is chosen, then demolition is really the preferred route. Um, so if, if council decides to build new, uh, new arena and recreation complex, and, and if the site, the subject site is chosen, then demolition is really the preferred route uh, for a number of reasons. And, and again, 
the, the presentation on June 9th will get into more depth, but we did want to be just open and transparent and forthright with, uh, with council and with the community with respect to this potential opportunity. Another potential opportunity is housing development. So we've had a number of preliminary conversations with the county um, around future housing needs. So of course, with any kind of large site, uh, that would be a potential opportunity that, that could be considered. Uh, health services is another potential uh, opportunity down the road um, that, that of course, paramedic services, for example, uh, is uh, the demand and the need for uh, paramedic location will only increase in the years to come. Uh, another potential opportunity is continued use um, as a school or, or potentially uh, other additional community uses, maybe a combination of uses that uh, could be leveraged or could be utilized at that particular facility. And uh, the last one that we identified is simply retaining the site for future needs. So retention of the land asset, uh, it's a desirable location, it's a desirable size, uh, it's got a lot of desirable characteristics, and simply from a strategic perspective, um, hanging onto that, that site or that location for future needs. And then of course, the last potential opportunity is kind of a catch-all and be-all, a uh, combination of the number of uses that I've listed. So maybe not one particular use, but maybe, you know, a combination of of housing and, and paramedics, for example, um, which, which certainly could be an option uh, for council. Again, just providing really all the potential options that staff sees uh, available at that site. If we move to the next slide, um, one of, the, one of the, the goals in the strategic plan was around recreation and, and enjoying uh, modern and accessible uh, sport, fitness, recreation activities. And again, under 3.1.3, it's very clear that, you know, we heard from the community and we heard from council that, you know, the town should really work with the property owners or other agencies to ensure the reuse of, uh, of this particular site as one of the sites identified for community uses, being recreation or housing or health or, or education. The next slide talks a little bit about the responsible finance goal, which is really just that you know, as a municipality, as a public entity, uh, we will continue to practice prudent and forward looking financial management. And from a staff perspective, the staff recommendation that's provided to committee does just that. If we move to the next slide, I expand a little bit on some potential opportunities and I caveat, caveat this with the word potential because, you know, there's a lot that can happen over the coming months. And, you know, we really have, have done some initial brainstorming um, but we've included some potential opportunities there that we could involve the community. So one opportunity, one option could be a walkthrough or a goodbye service, if you want to call it, to really give the public an opportunity to say their final goodbyes. Um, that could be in person or it could be, um, it could be an, a, an opportunity to schedule uh, visits uh, in accordance with public health uh, restrictions. Another option that we've looked at, and we, we feel very strong that this is an option regardless of which way we go or which way council decides to go, is really doing some sort of filmed historical presentation uh, for the benefit of a museum exhibit. So we could engage uh, past teachers or past students or past parents, sharing their memories and photos and, and ultimately compile that into a documentary film. And uh, that is one that we're rather excited about. And, and would like to explore regardless of which way council decides to go. Another option in terms of preserving and community ideas, you know, maybe the potential opportunity to reuse or reuse, I should say, uh, a component of the building and maybe build it into, uh, if there's something new that's developed on that property, to build it into whatever that new development might be. So it could be the gym floor logo, for example. Uh, or it could be a component of the main entrance uh, of the existing facility and building that into some sort of entrance way. Um, so just really brainstorming some potential opportunities there. And the last piece that we, uh, we identify is some sort of memorabilia distribution or reuse of school equipment or assets and really offering residents or local businesses an opportunity to select um, existing chattels or components within the building that they may have a use for. Um, and this could be 
uh, through some form of community auction, for example, where we might engage a third party to manage and facilitate that on behalf of the municipality. We really would encourage the public and residents and businesses and, and organizations to stay connected. And we would welcome all and any ideas that they may have in terms of how we can memorialize this building, uh, regardless of which way council decides to go with respect to the options. The, with, respect to, with respect to the last piece, we will of course, you know, as this project advances down the road, we will continue to be open and transparent with the community and be very, uh, be very forthright with respect to what, what's happening and any opportunity for the community to get involved. And if we advance to the next slide, um, I, I don't, this is really the concluding slide. Uh, really, thank you for, for thank you to committee for for hearing the presentation. Thank you to those listening, be it at home or or with us this evening. And while my name is on that final slide, there really is a number of folks that that contributed immensely to not only this presentation but also the staff report. And so, with that, uh, your worship. Uh, I'd be happy to field or take any questions uh, as you deem appropriate. Thank you, Mr. CAO. Um, members of council, uh, do any members of council have any questions to, to the CAO? I know that we uh, certainly have been uh, made aware of the situation and that uh, we have all had the opportunity to see and look at uh, the review prior to this evening. So um, if there are no questions there from the CAO uh, in regards to the presentation, um, I'm wondering, Mr. CAO, if we have any members of the public uh, present that might have questions. Your Worship, my suggestion to you would, would be exactly that, that if, you know, of course, it's your call as the chair, but if, uh, as we had discussed, if there are questions from the public, I would be certainly welcome, I would certainly be happy to entertain any questions that might be on the floor. Okay, thank you. So with that, I will put it out. If there is anyone with us this evening, joined us, if they have any questions to the CAO in regards to 51 Dunlop Street, uh, just make yourself aware of, uh, by just coming online. So I see no one with that. Thank you, Mr. CAO. Presentation very well done. And we will move on to our next presentation. And our next presentation this evening is from Sajeki Planning, Read the Town Doc Secondary Plan. And I will turn it over to our plan. Andrea, oh, thank, you. You. thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mayor and members of council. It took me a second to uh, get my computer working. So I'm very happy tonight to introduce uh, the people you may know, but David and Dylan uh, from Sajaki Planning, and they are going to give the presentation tonight. So I will turn it over to them to start off. Okay. Great. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Andrea, Mr. Mayor, and members of the committee. I'm just wondering if we can open up the presentation. I'm not sure if that's going to be, it may be Sarah or it may be Mishi, but I know one of them is going to open and share the presentation, the PowerPoint. Okay. Hi, Mishi here. I can share just one minute, disconnecting. Thanks, thanks Mishi. Great, um, thank you very much Mishi and, and thank you again, Mr. Mayor, members of the committee. It's been a pleasure working on the plan and we're very excited um, to share the vision uh, that, that we've been developing with, with the town for the future of the town dock tonight. Uh, Penetanguishing Harbor is the, the gem of Georgian Bay and we're hopeful that, that the plan provides the ability for that gem to shine just a, a little bit uh, brighter. Uh, next slide, please. I'm not going to go into any details regarding the project team, uh, but I, I will say again that it's been, and it continues to be a pleasure working with Andrea and her team. Uh, in terms of the consultant team, Sajeki Planning 
uh, is leading the land use planning and the design component of the study. We're working with Strategy Corp on the economic strategy. Laura Consulting is advising, uh, has been advising on public engagement and consultation and Scribe has been advising on technical writing. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, actually, if you just hold one second just before starting the video, but a, a little later in the presentation, Dylan Dewsbury is going to describe the key secondary plan and master plan findings, as well as a phasing plan. Um, but, but they say that uh, when giving a presentation, you should say what you're gonna say, then you say it, then, then you say it again. Uh, we are gonna do that, but we're gonna start instead of saying it off the bat, just by playing a video. And this video will provide a bird's eye view coming down into what the future of, of the town dock could look like. Slightly choppy because of internet connectivity. Now this is obviously the long-term vision for the dock and it'll take a while to get there, but we have a series of three phases um, that uh, we'll be sharing tonight as well that will describe how, how we can get there. And this image is a plan view looking down at the, the entire site. Um, we'll get into the area in more detail, but there's a whole number of um, elements that we're quite excited about that, that we will describe. So next slide, please. Tonight, what we're going to talk about is the study purpose, as well as a study schedule. Uh, we've been out for a number of consultation events, so we'll talk about what we've heard from the public and what the priorities are um, of, of, of the public okay. and other stakeholders that we've met with. Uh, as I mentioned, it, Dylan Dewsbury from Sujaki Planning is going to talk to the preferred option. Um, and the, the, which is the draft master plan, as well as the three phases that create that plan. Um, and then also the highlights of the secondary plan. So we have a series of schedules identifying um, the public realm, land uses, um, as, as well as the transportation network that, that um, Dylan will speak to. Um, we'll speak to some of the high level policy recommendations and It'll be turned back over to me to speak to the implementation phase and plan and, and questions. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So what is a secondary plan? A secondary plan um, it forms part of the official plan uh, and it provides more detailed policies for the area that they cover. And that can include the types and uses of buildings um, directions around public spaces, directions around parking and urban design. Um, the reason for completing a secondary plan for the town dock is that we know that there are, is investment that is required in the near future. And it's also an incredible asset that has a lot of opportunities. Um, and in order to really uh, maximize and leverage what those opportunities are, the intent is that the secondary plan will be a tool to implement a, the, the vision of, that you'll see in the master plan. So what does a secondary plan achieve? It is to develop that vision to guide future design and development. And it considers a whole number of, of factors uh, with respect to this plan, it's access to the downtown, um, to Champlain Wendat Park, to the trail system, um, ensuring that public access is maintained to the area and particularly along the waterfront. Um, and considering the history of the area, its heritage and its culture, uh, and looking at really just, just how can this place be envisioned as um, uh, uh, remaining a public area, but really maximizing the, the, the benefits of the space. Next slide, please. So this slide just identifies the, the schedule. It's been a, actually a quite a quick project. So it, it kicked off in November, 2020. Um, we went out to the public for the first time in 
early February. And that was a visioning workshop where we asked um, people how they use the space and what are their priorities for the space in terms of what they would like to see. Um, following the visioning workshop, we posted online a survey um, for residents and other stakeholders to respond to. And we developed three master plan options. In Mar on March 24th, those options went back out to the public along with another survey. And since the end of March, what we've been doing is developing a preferred option, as well as preparing the secondary plan and the master plan, um, which, which I believe has been circulated. And we're presenting it to the Committee of the Whole today um, for the draft plan for, for uh, recommendation, for, well, I, I should say um, for input into the plan. And then it goes to the public on May 26. And then we are back, I, I can't see the date. I think it's June 12th. Let me just short, lower my screen. Oh, sorry, June 9th, we're back to the Committee of the Whole with the final secondary plan recommendations. So next slide, please. In, and next slide. In terms of what we've heard uh, during the workshop, there's been um, a number of uh, just sort of key input from the public. And really important to that is that they want the uh, whole town dock to be accessible to the public, um, to have a, a waterfront that provides strong public gas access that views um, to, to the water are maintained and improved. Um, in one of the earlier options, there was a hotel that would have had an impact on the view down from uh, Main Street, but, but that's no longer included in the, in the plan. Um, some of the other most liked features from the previous options where they wanted to see less parking and more green space. They wanted to see a boardwalk and promenade along the waterfront and to really focus on people friendly spaces some of the thoughts that were missing from the three options were they wanted to see improved docks with more rooms for boats, improved connectivity, um, such as uh, paths, um, wayfinding and signage throughout the site, improved public facilities, including accessible washrooms and showers. Uh, the opportunity for commercial uses, we heard about this from, from both, both sides, uh, but in terms of the majority of comments, there were interest in some commercial uses, but small scale commercial uses such as um, uh, coffee shop, ice cream, um, or, or, or kiosks to rent um, uh, boats. Um, there was also questions around more details on locations for the boat launch and, and the hotel. So next slide, please. Uh, a number of additional considerations were brought up as well too that we need to consider in the study. The first is that there's an increased capacity needed for large boats um, with the Island Princess uh, coming to Penetang. Uh, that needs to be accommodated as well as the potential for future ferries as well. Um, the, D2, the Ministry of the Environment D2 guidelines um, have a hundred meter buffer for sensitive land uses such as residential um, or, hotels, or hotel uses that are to be outside of that buffer from the sewage treatment plant. Um, the official plan has a 15 meter setback from the water for new buildings um, for sites that are below sea level of which the town dock is. Um, and so existing buildings are closer than 15 meters, but that was something that we needed to take into consideration as the plan was developed, but it also opens up more of the, the waterfront to the public. Um, flood mitigation measures such as looking at um, ways to mitigate stormwater on site. Uh, through permeable pavers, through, through um, low impact development techniques were consideration. And we have also had lots of um, conversations with Andrea and, and Sherry around capital budget planning um, and some of the immediate needs around uh, the tech and the, the uh, wharf substructure. So next slide, please. Uh, we, I, I know the, the group has seen a previous vision statement, um, but that has been up to the public and that has been um, revised and updated as, as shown in, in the report. But the updated vision statement is that the town dock will be an active and vibrant destination that reflects Penetanguishing's heritage and culture. It will serve as a centralized public space that is safe and inclusive with spectacular views of the water that can be enjoyed and accessed year round. Its connection to downtown will be enhanced through opportunities that support the local community and economy. Next slide, please. 
And with that, um, this is an image. We have a whole number of images at the end too uh, that we will share in terms of um, how we see the, the, the future of the town dock evolving. But I'm gonna turn it over to Dylan to speak to the preferred option that has evolved from the initial three options that were um, well shared with the TAC and, and shared with the public and, and others as well. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dylan Dewsbury. Thanks, David. Hi, Evan. I'm Dylan, and um, I'm just going to run us through the fun part of the, um, the evening, which is the preferred option that we've developed. Uh, so next slide, Mishi. Uh, so this just shows the existing site as, um, as it currently sits, uh, obviously with a lot of uh, surface parking and the white and green area there. Next slide. And this is the bird's eye view of the uh, 3D rendering that we've um, developed. So uh, this is where we start to see uh, the vision statement come into play where it's um, a centralized public space. It's connected to downtown and um, uh, Rotary Champlain Wendat Park. Um, it's green, uh, as it's pedestrian oriented. There's uh, continuous public access to the water. Um, so it's, we're just trying to make it a, a welcoming, inviting space uh, that people can either flow through or come and stay. Uh, so it's welcoming uh, whichever way you come from. If you're arriving by boat, then uh, you just saw a view from the water as you would come in um, or down Main Street, you'd be greeted by the tick and um, continuous views uh, out to the water. Or if you're coming along through the park, then um, you're greeted with a, a green sort of area and then um, flows through into the public square. Uh, next slide, Mishi. So obviously the town dock won't be built in a day. Um, so we're envisioning a 15-year uh, horizon. And phase one will occur in the short term, uh, which is within the first five years. So in this um, stage, the major changes to the built form uh, will be the relocation of the tick and the installation of uh, new public restrooms and shower facilities. Um, the current unsealed parking area next to the sewage treatment plant will be formalized and incorporate some low design, uh, low impact design features. And then the initial landscaping and greening efforts uh, in combination with reducing the existing parking would begin to transform the town dock and into a more pedestrian friendly space. Um, so this map displays the end of phase one, um, but there will be incremental steps taken each year. So for instance, in, maybe in the first year, it's temporarily removing the first couple of rows of parking close to the water. Um, and then, you know, having a few temporary events in the parking area. And then the next couple of years, it might be removing some of those sections of parking permanently. Um, so kind of peeling it back. And then at the same time, the parking would be formalized on the south side. Uh, so there's other options. And this option, uh, in this uh, phase, sorry, the boat launch will be retained in the short mm -hmm. term. Uh, so mm -hmm. some of the unsealed parking area will be kept for the mm -hmm. parking of boat trailers. Mm -hmm. So that's that kind of brown area you see uh, with this unsealed um, area at the moment. I apologize if there's background noise. My puppy is <laughs> a little bit ill. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can hear that. Um, so sorry, in the short term, the use of the town dock uh, will be focused on experimentation of the lands through seasonally relevant activities um, that are community driven and temporary in nature. So diverse activities will be planned and executed in partnerships with community groups, uh, indigenous communities and the local businesses, uh, perhaps some of the businesses from Main Street. Uh, we'll go into a little more detail about what that might look like later in the presentation. Uh, so also in phase one, a wayfinding strategy will be developed to strengthen the identity of the town dock through consistent branding, uh, signage and navigational cues. Uh, so next phase, Mishi. D Dylan, you may just want to actually identify to the new location for the tech. Um, where oh, sure. Sorry, that wasn't. Um, so it's the, it's been moved to the intersection of Main Street and um, in between those two parking areas. So I mean, the, the top parking area is currently where that roundabout is. Um, so that's after the parking's been peeled back a little further and that's the remaining parking at the town dock. And then the tick is just south of that, um, that rectangular building that Mishi was pointing out. Um, and that's the final location. Uh, the choice 
to move that into phase one is uh, essentially financial um, and we're talking to the, the town about that. Uh, so next phase. Uh, so phase two will occur in the medium term uh, and that's years six through to 10. So during phase two, existing parking vehicle access would be further reduced to make way for uh, the permanent public square. And the design shown in the map is indicative only. Uh, a more detailed design would be considered in the lead up to phase two. However, we envision a public square that reflects the town's history in some way. So the circle design shown represents uh, the railway turntable in reference to the old railway that was uh, used to occupy the site. Um, so major changes in this phase would include the shoreline infrastructure, uh, including the installation of a waterfront promenade, um, and then the replacement of or expansion of the existing dock as well um, could start to take place. Uh, a new permanent kiosk would be located. Um, that's that northern building at the tip there, close to where the tick is now. Uh, so the kiosk would be would build on the lessons learned during phase one. So in phase one, there might be some temporary structures placed there. And then before making a permanent decision, um, the, you know, the town could review what was successful in the first phase and um, build on those successes. So that kiosk, um, that's a new, you know, commercial uh, use that could occupy that space. And as David mentioned, it could sell, you know, something simple like ice creams or coffee um, or operate a rental um, equipment rental facility for, uh, you know, kayaks in the summer and then maybe some skates or snowshoes in the winter. Uh, landscaping and greening of the space would continue through this phase uh, with an emphasis on the low impact development um, practices to contribute towards the sustainable design. And uh, many of the recommendations from the wayfinding strategy would start to be implemented. Um, so there would be some new signage, um, a couple of gateways established, um, and it would create connections to and throughout the site, as well as um, the surrounding areas like Rotary Champagne, Wendat Park or downtown. Uh, the boat launch you may notice is relocated during this phase. Um, so that would be to one of the alternate sites that uh, the preliminary um, sites that the town's identified. Um, or maybe something else comes up in phase one that might be more appropriate. Um, the dock lunch would also be relocated into a new building that's set back further from the water's edge. Uh, so that's the 15 metres back from the water. Um, so it would maintain the use of the dock lunch, but in a more, in a refurbished uh, new building. Um, so these two changes would open, would really open up that area prioritizing pedestrian access to the water and fostering the connection um, to the park to the south. Uh, one item that has been brought to our attention already um, based on these, this draft is um, access for snowmobilers and parking for snowmobiles. Uh, so we're still considering and talking to the snowmobile community about where uh, that would be appropriate, but um, it's intended to continue um, throughout phases of the, turn, of the um, implementation. So in terms of programming, phase two is focused on consolidation. Um, so this would be of town sanctioned or community supported events that are built on the stakeholder partnerships and successes from uh, phase one. Uh, next phase, Mishi. So phase three is the long-term, uh, which is years 11 through to 15. And phase three is focused on confirmation of the vision and includes the final steps towards implementing the preferred master plan option. So a new Northern Peninsula, you can see has popped up in the water there, um, and that will be formed you know, off the concrete wharf, and it would include an urban beach, uh, that's that area there, and, the, and a picnic lawn. Um, so this would allow people to take in the views of the water and engage in uh, recreational activities there, whether it be a leisurely picnic or uh, potentially some uh, uh, marine activities. And then the wharf that continues out there would continue to provide access to ships such as the Georgian Queen or the Island Princess. Uh, substantial expansion and reconfiguration of the dock uh, would be completed to increase its usage and capacity. And in this phase, uh, maintenance of existing landscaping, uh, some more mature trees and the build out of the final landscaping would occur. Uh, so this is 
aiming to create a beautiful green connected space uh, to be enjoyed year round. And the programming uh, will be further developed and refined based on the lessons from phase one and two, so capitalizing on successes. And uh, we'll now provide locals and visitors with uh, lots of diverse reasons to visit the town dock. Uh, next, Mishi. So this is just an annotated plan uh, that shows all of those implementations with the final um, iteration. So you can see the urban beach uh, up at number one, and then the landscaped area for picnics at number two. Uh, there's the waterfront uh, kiosk at number three, close to where the tick was. Uh, four is the, the park or public square. Uh, five is the new tick. Uh, these numbers are a little small, but yeah, that's where Mishy's pointing now. Uh, so that's located to be very visible from Main Street and um, uh, aiming to connect the town dock with downtown. And then next to that would be shower area and public washrooms. Uh, number seven, just south of that, is where a, a shuttle bus or um, public transit would stop and provide access to the town dock, um, or just a pedestrian drop off and pickup area. Uh, number 10 identifies a couple of electric vehicle charging stations. Um, so another important aspect is uh, maintaining the function of the sewage treatment plant. So uh, number 11 is the west gate there. So trucks will still be allowed to um, access and maintain their current function there. Uh, number 12 is a waterfront promenade. And number 13 is the redesigned dock layout. Uh, and number 14 would be an elevated viewing deck. So uh, we're envisioning perhaps a raised deck above the tick and um, the town and the dock lunch. It would just provide some very scenic views out of the water and could um, be used in a few events as well. Next slide, please. So number uh, four is the overview of the secondary plan. Next slide. So these are the schedules. Um, I won't, <laughs> we would be here all night if we went through all the policies. So we'll keep it pretty high level. Um, so the first schedule is just the secondary plan area. Um, next slide, please. So this is the land use slide. Um, the two colours represent the existing land use designations uh, around. So the town dock is currently downtown and waterfront area. And we're proposing to maintain that use with some um, site specific provisions. So limiting sensitive uses, um, which is uh, necessary next to the sewage treatment plant. Um, we're also just kind of targeting what um, is desirable to have at the town dock. And then major open space area is the designation for Champagne, uh, Rotary Champagne Wendat Park. So it's kind of continuing that uh, land use throughout the town dock to keep it nice and open and um, airy and green. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Schedule C is the public realm framework. So this is where we uh, implement some of the uh, more key feedback that we've received. Um, so the view corridors you can see, for example, uh, to maintain the views up and down Main Street and out to the water. Um, this also highlights a few of the, um, the built form policies, such as the active frontages on the buildings. Um, so around the change in land use designation, uh, we've got some active frontages to make sure it's all engaging. Um, there's also a couple of gateways identified. So we've got primary gateways, which would be where the tick is and from the, the dock from the water. So they're the, I guess, the main entry points and then secondary gateways as well, which would be from Fox Street and, um, and then the entry to the park as well. Uh, this identifies uh, it matches up with the policies in the secondary plan that identify the, the main reason or the, uh, the driving uh, forces behind each of these decisions. So keeping the waterfront promenade open and accessible, um, keeping certain areas pedestrian friendly, and then certain other areas nice and green. Uh, next slide, please. And then the last slide is the movement and transportation um, schedule. So this just highlights the trails that would be uh, established and uh, they would be multi-use trails. So 
you know, walking and cycling in the summer and then um, perhaps some winter trails or skating trails. Um, and then we've also highlighted where the parking would be located, uh, where the pedestrian pickup and shuttle bus would be, and then some bicycle parking stations. Um, so how people, you know, get to the site and move around the site. Uh, another addition to that would be the snowmobiling, which um, we're still working out. Next slide, please. So this is just a nice scenic picture from the water. This is, um, if you're arrived by boat, then this is what you might see approaching the concrete wall from the left and the, the new dock set up on the right. Uh, next slide. Uh, so these are the secondary plan headings. Um, again, I won't go into too much detail, otherwise we'd be here all night, but um, so it starts off with an int introduction, uh, the vision statement that uh, David mentioned, the guiding principles that we've developed through the consultations. And then number four is where it gets into the, um, the bulk of the, the plan. And these are the policies. The policies have been developed based on the master plan vision. So it's essentially implementing uh, what we see as the final master plan. So, you know, land use and site development that uh, recommends the appropriate uh, land uses at the town dock, which might be, you know, a restaurant to maintain the dock lunch um, and some other potential commercial uses, um, but keeping a lot of the area open and um, publicly accessible. Uh, the public realm policies that, um, you know, maintain view corridors and uh, ensure that it's pedestrian friendly and uh, movement, um, including how it's accessed and um, where parking is located. Uh, the cultural heritage, so, you know, ensuring that the town dock does reflect the town's history and culture. Natural heritage and sustainability contains um, policies around the low impact design. Um, so making sure that we're looking after the potential flooding impacts and um, ensuring that there's uh, proper infiltration and um, the site remains nice and green. And then economic development. So uh, that was a key, um, key part of the strategic plan was maximising the economic potential of the waterfront. So there's policies around that as well. And then number five is um, how the plan is implemented in um, administration matters. Um, so with that, I'll pass it back over to David to talk about um, how the plan might be implemented. Great, uh, thank you, Dylan. And so, so in terms of how do we implement the plan and, and how do we implement the vision, uh, there's a series of tools to implement the secondary plan, which is again, based on the master plan. Um, the first is that there would be an official plan amendment, which would be based on the town doc secondary plan. Uh, there would need to be an amendment to the zoning bylaw in, in order to um, provide the correct direction around the, the secondary plan. Um, the main park or public square area, the theme for that would need to be um, detailed out through further consultation. Um, further engagement um, and design. Uh, some of the ideas that we have discussed are Penetang Machine's history with the timber industry, um, the history with the railroads, hence uh, why we had the railroad turntable. Um, there's also discussion around the, the Indigenous and Métis um, history um, and, and other cultural aspects of, of Penetang Machine. Um, Another implementation tool would be developing further the wayfinding and branding strategy. It's my understanding that the town has recently gone through a wayfinding and branding strategy. Uh, so it would be really tying to that. Um, this plan uh, has prepared a economic development strategy and that is around what we're calling the four by four challenge. And that is based on four years. So it's for the first phase of development, um, four events, four seasons and four reasons to come um, to the town dock. So developing that out further around the implementation of it, um, working with the existing capital budget, uh, but also developing that further in terms of the, the cost and the list of the capital works projects. Um, there have been a number of sites that are potential identifications for relocating the boat launch, but the specific location for that would need to be determined um, as well also uh, 
the potential for looking at um, other sites that, that have been discussed for, for the hotel. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide just identifies in terms of the four by four challenge. Um, one of the first things that is identified within that is that uh, in year one, it proposes one new marquee event that the town would host um, and or operate uh, or sponsor and three events that the community could do in the other three seasons. Um, this image that we're seeing here identifies and the whole purpose is to get um, more people using the town dock um, and, and using it in, in, in different ways um, than it is, is, is necessarily used today. And this first image identifies a quick win for how one of the community events could be held. Um, it's just an example, and, but, but some of the thoughts that have been discussed are a spring flower market, a New Year's Day hot chocolate and cider hangout, and a fall um, healthy harvest tailgate farmer's market. Those would be community events. And the next slide shows what is a potential for um, a, a town organized event. And this would be a, a, a one day, and these are obviously, you would still keep Winterama and other festivals like that. Um, but this is the opportunity for a one day um, uh, yard sale. Um, it would be the suggestions that would be organized by the town. Um, it would be a community sale. Uh, local businesses would be offered kiosks. Um, the town dock, uh, uh, the dock line, sorry, um, food truck could be used, uh, ideas around it, a, a sign that says Je Tem, uh, 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 Jem, Jem machine, um, and, and other ideas for uh, a beer tent, for example, but just to bring the community, uh, the community down. Um, so next slide, please. And in terms of next steps, so the immediate next steps are that on May 26, uh, next slide please Mishi, on May 26, there's scheduled for a public meeting to present the draft secondary plan. Um, and then quickly between now the public meeting and uh, June 9th, it would be coming, be coming back to the uh, committee of the whole with the final secondary plan. Um, so with that, I, I may turn it back over to Andrea, but I think what we'll do actually first um, before opening it up to 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 um, Andrea or 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 to the to the mayor, um, is just there's a few other images that we can also show to you that we've developed for um, the the town dock. So this would be looking, um, I guess this would be looking north east towards the slightly relocated dock lunch with the viewing deck above. Um, you can see the wider waterfront promenade. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, a, a night vision. Oh, now we can, you know, we can just run through these quickly. So this is the night vision of, of the area, um, looking again from the water. Um, that's the kiosk on the left. Next slide, please. Uh, and next slide. Uh, this image is looking towards the, the lawn that would be for picnics. So this would be where the Island Princess um, uh, or other cruise ships in the future um, could use as the, the, the area for docking. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is an image looking down onto the, the, the public park, along with the, you can see, um, I guess in the, the uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the tech, you can see the area for the passenger pickup drop-off and the shuttle bus drop-off, the parking. And you can see it's open um, at street level, but you can see above both, both the Tourist Information Center and the dock lunch that there would be that viewing platform. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you can see the, the, the new kiosk as well. Next slide, please. Uh, the view of the beach and the, the, um, the, the picnic lawn. Next slide, please. And the docks. Um, and this is a view looking down again towards, this is from the picnic um, area looking towards the beach. Next slide, please. Uh, <laughs> this is a rendering that's starting to look, it's looking north and it is um, starting to look at more of an all seasons image. Next slide, please. There's also the potential that a lot of these trails could be used as skating trails in the winter. Um, an area of where the new entrance off of Main Street. Next slide, please. 
Um, and this is looking from the park uh, towards the viewing deck, the Tourist Information Center, of, of which the, the design of the Tourist Information Center has not been done at all. Um, and the parking, and this is a view from the, uh, I believe from the viewing deck. Uh, so maybe we can, maybe we can um, in a night, a night view, but maybe we, instead of going through the rest of the images, maybe we can just um, turn it over to, to uh, any questions. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Dion. And with that, uh, if you would uh, give us back our public. Uh... Thank you. And so with that, members of council or anyone out there in the public that may have questions, uh, make yourself known and uh, Let's see what we can do with uh, answering any questions that or concerns that we may have uh, with the council. Uh, I am quite aware, familiar, because they have their cards that uh, I can see if they wish to uh, make comment or speak or ask questions uh, with the uh, members of the public uh, or citizens or makers that are on board that may have a question or concern. Uh, then I would ask that uh, you uh, just uh, put your screen on and uh, and then I can give you the option to speak. And I'm going to start off now because the first card I saw was Deputy Mayor. So Madam Deputy Mayor, you go and then I see you, Councillor Levy, next. Thank you, Your Worship. A lot to digest. I wonder, I guess one question I have, what was the thinking behind making an additional space which you call um, not only a picnic space but swimming that we like I just wonder where that came from we do have swimming areas within our community and I just wondered having a swimming area at a busy town dock is that really the best thing, the best use of, the, of that property or that spot. Um, through, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to, to you, Deputy Mayor uh, DeVoe, uh, it's first, it's, it's not a swimming area. Um, so there is no access to the water for swimming. Um, the idea between around phase three uh, is, is really, um, we, we had a, an initial, vision that is around, if you really want to animate a space, a public space and a waterfront space, we want to think around around 10 activities that can bring people to the town dock. And those will be different activities at different times. Um, but we thought that it would be within those 10 activities, we thought that the idea of having a space where people can, you know, lay out on, an, on a nice day, watch the boats um, and, you know, it, it is with, there is sand there, but it's not for swimming. It'd be a nice area as well as providing an area for people to have a picnic. And with uh, improvements that are required to the uh, wharf substructure, we thought it was an opportunity to look at how the, the cruise ships would use the area and build that out further. Um, I will say too that, uh, you know, phase three, which includes that area, does not, we think it's a great thing to achieve it. We still think the plan stands on its own with, with phase two that does not include the addition of the picnic area in the uh, beach, but we are strong supporters of, of phase three and what it, what it could bring. But absolutely, and there's been lots of conversations around on the, how busy the area is with boats, so there's no intention of swimming from the town down. Thank you. Okay, okay Councillor DB. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to uh, David and his team. Um, I see no parking at our town dock, which confuses me greatly. We are thrilled to pieces to get the Island Princess coming into our town to uh, restore uh, boat cruises. We have the dock lunch. We have the Georgian Queen. We have all the existing boaters and potentially we'll add more. And there doesn't appear to be any place for them to park. A shuttle bus is not appropriate for a small tourist town. 
Uh, I go to small towns all the time, like Bracebridge, Huntsville, et cetera. And when I visit their amenities, I do expect to be able to park at their amenities. Um, I, we have parkland. We have lots of fabulous parkland. My goal here in this plan would be to see us appropriately connect to the parkland, not to become another parkland. So quite frankly and bluntly, there's not a whole lot about this plan that I like. Um, as far as a long-term plan of getting rid of our boat launch, I don't think so. Our boat launch defines us. Our town dock defines us. Uh, we, everything that is shown here, other than relocation eventually of the tick, which I would support, um, and appropriate accessible washrooms and showers, which is much needed and has been on the books for a while. Um, I, I think there is a way to uh, accomplish the needs of our local people and our visitors without blowing the whole thing up and removing all that our uh, visitors and our residents hold dear, which is go to the town dock, go grab a burger at the dock, use the washroom, uh, launch a fishing boat. So I'm sorry, but I, I, I just, I can't wrap my head about reinventing Penetanguishing in this manner. Uh, the goal in the, initially was to connect the main street down to the dock and the dock over to Waterfront Park through signage and, and an appropriate walkway. Uh, and I truly believe that's what we need. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, to you, Councillor Levy. Um, I mean, your, your comment is, is loud and clear. Um, I, I will say what we have attempted to do through this project is, is what we attempt to do through um, every project that we do. And it's, it's based on, um, you know, evidence-based planning. And, and the numbers that we've been provided with is that uh, parking utilization averaged in the summer at 21% uh, of 120 spaces and the parking that is provided in the plan is 50% uh, of what is the existing parking down there. So right now there's approximately 120 spaces. The plan provides um, uh, uh, 60, 60 odd spaces. In order to accommodate this plan, it is dependent on the relocation of the boat launch. And, and that is true in phase one, um, the area that is to the east of the dock lunch uh, remains there for um, uh, parking for trailers um, for people to continue to use that boat launch. But what we have heard from the public, um, and, and there, you know, there, there, there was mixed messages on it, but what we heard from a lot of the public is that there's a, more parking that is down there right now than what they would like to see. And I appreciate that for um, uh, boaters with the boat launch that that does provide a different context. So for this plan um, to operate to phase three, it, it, it does require um, in, envisioning the location of the boat launch in a different area. Okay, Member, other members of council, Councillor Mayotte. Thank you, your worship. Like, nice presentation, I enjoyed it. It was very nice what you put out on paper. But again, you hit it on a note, like my main concern, we haven't even looked at a secondary place to do the launching ramp. If we do find an area for the launching ramp, what kind of money are we talking? Dredging, concrete ramp, some more docks, parking, which means you got to level wherever you are, but concrete, I mean, not concrete, but asphalt. Like to me, that would be my first concern if we do find an area to have a new launching ramp in town, which to me, I think is very important because we do have a lot of our people from Penetang, Wachine, Tiny and Tate and even Midland that come and fish in Penetang Bay. And um, I hate to lose the launching ramp, but if we do find an area, what kind of money are we talking now to build a new launching ramp? That's my main concern. Thank you. David, you have uh, an answer for that one? Um, 
if we could pull up the the presentation, Mishi, there are as part of the study, we're we're not recommending the location for the uh, the new location for the boat launch. I mean, that does require further study, and 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 to to uh, the councillor's point, um, it, it does require uh, looking at the the costs the costs associated with it. Uh, but if we could, Misha, if we were able to pull up the slideshow, we could identify the, the sites that are under consideration for, I believe there are three sites that are under location for the, the boat launch. So I believe it's right, oh, there you go. Um, so the sites are, uh, or there's two, there's, two, there's two primary sites that are being looked at. Um, they're towards the, nor the northern side and the southern side of, uh, of, of the area. Um, Andrea, are you, are you, could you give the, sorry, just the names or they're, I'm missing them right now of the, the two locations? Yes, certainly, David, thanks very much. So um, we were looking at one of the sites at being the south end, or sorry, the west end of Rotary Wind at Champlain or Champlain Park um, near the Jibway Landing site or the dog park or somewhere in that general area, or alternatively uh, up at Heronia Park uh, at the beach there again. Um, nothing specific, but from town uh, access points for uh, the waterfront for a launch, those are potential uh, opportunities that we brought forward. Mm -hmm. uh, thank, thanks, Mishu. I think we can stop sharing. Okay. Councillor LaRose. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, quite the presentation, guys. Uh, it's quite, quite different. It's new and unique, but I, I don't know whether you quite took into account that we've already spent $6 million in our waterfront park. That's our people use park. Um, I, I have no idea what this would cost us, and I hope you guys have a general idea within five or ten million dollars of of what it would cost to redo the launch ramp and, and change the building and tear down the dock lunch, which isn't ours, and rebuild a new one and put out these uh, picnic zones in front of the other existing condos in front of their place. Um, I find the whole thing just, as Councillor Levy put it, uh, very, very, very strange. It is very unlike our town. Uh, I don't like the views and the vistas. I, I find it better now that you can go down to the parking lot, grab an ice cream, walk out onto the dock, look up the bay, look down the bay, you see everything you need to see. In your initial spot, you're showing about 70 boat parking slips or parts store, sorry, 70 slips for boats, and you only have about 60 parking spots. So if it was a warm Saturday in the summer, nobody could go to the launch ramp, nobody could go to the tour boat, 60% of the people just went out on their, their, their boat rental slips. So we're way, way, way short on parking it drives people away from our main street because our main street gets full of boat traffic going to their boat. I don't think we would be able to rent those spaces very well in a year or two because as a boater, if I have to walk an eighth of a mile or a quarter of a mile, try to carry gas and pop and groceries and picnics and hold the kids and go all that way, boating becomes no fun. We have a very, very busy launch ramp now. I don't know where you guys got your information for, for 20%, but if you went down there, probably 18 of 20 weekends in the summer, we were using overflow parking. We were having to get people parking as far away as the curling club. So if we're gonna add a new tour boat and you guys are gonna make the, the parking smaller, it absolutely will not work. The other thing, just because most of it's been covered, is it, again, the cost. We've invested millions of dollars in that launching ramp and in the docks. A lot of it has been paid for by the users, which is as well it should be, but all that would just be gone in this plan. We, we would just redo it all. 
So my one and only question is, because I don't like the, the way the plan is at all, I will not be supporting it, is what would be a general cost to implement this plan, say over the, the 15 years? Okay, thank you. David? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to you, uh, Councillor Rose. Um, in terms of the plan, it is being identified in a series of steps. Um, the first phase, the first two phases can be done without significant um, capital expenditures. By the time you get to the third phase, that is a phase that the capital expenditures would increase um, significantly. We, we could work to provide order of magnitude uh, costs uh, to come back with, with those numbers. Um, but that is why I say too that the, the third phase is a phase that I believe would be wonderful. Um, and I believe everyone on the team that has worked on the plan believes it would be wonderful, but that is one that would um, entail a, a much more significant financial investment than the first two phases. Just a supplemental, your worship, uh, off the top of your head, David, if you guys have done this before for other places and different projects, is this a $10 million project, a $20 million project, 50, 100? Uh, uh, yeah. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to, to your Councillor LaRose, uh, I would appreciate the opportunity to come back to you with, with the number rather than um, providing a number uh, on, on the spot. I think that's up there, David. Uh, Councillor uh, Bollebonker, that I see your card. Go ahead. Thank you, Worship. Um, I appreciate all the comments that were uh, made tonight. I uh, appreciate the presentation as well. Uh, Council, we're gonna have a public meeting on this on the 26th of May, I believe. And I think that uh, the steering committee of which I sit on along with uh, Councillor Cummings, I think this is all good input along with the input that we'll get at the public meeting on the 26th. And I think uh, the members of the committee can take all this back and and think about it again and then uh, and then be in a position to bring something forward to council based on all the input we've heard. So anyway, I just wanted to make that comment to say thank you to the presenters and, and thanks for the comments and we'll take all of this back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor uh, Wadewalker for that. And yes, we uh, do plan on having a meeting on the 26th uh, that will involve the public. And uh, I don't know if there are any members of the public here with us this evening that have any questions or comments. Okay, there doesn't appear to be. So with that, David and Diamond, we thank you for your presentation this evening and look forward to our public meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So next on our agenda, we have a presentation from Molo Fave, our Chief Water Operator, read the Water Division Summary Reports, Inspections and Audits and Communications. So with that, um, Mo, if you're there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm trying to find the video on here. I'm having trouble with this machine. Mo, just to interrupt you, I'll share the video and play it from uh, my computer, if that's okay. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor LaRue and members of council. Um, I appreciate the opportunity you've given us to discuss governance of the water division operations. Annual reports are required under section 11 of Ontario Regulation 17003. 
They must contain description of systems, list of chemicals used in the treatment of water, any reports made to the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, such as adverse notifications and any corrective actions, results of tests required, major expenses incurred, and locations where copies of the report can be obtained. The summary report we produce every year is required under Schedule 22 of Ontario Regulation 17003 and must be submitted to the owners of the system no later than March 31st of the following year. While we are only required to prepare this report for the owners of the drinking water system, which by definition is council, we include much more in it that makes a great tool for quick reference for water operators, the Ministry of Environment officers, QMS auditors, council, consultants, and the general public upon request. We also post it on the town's website for the general public if they wish to download it or view it online. Notification of the completed reports are posted on the local newspaper and on the town's website. This report must list the requirements of the Act, the regulations, the system's approvals, drinking water works permits, and municipal drinking water licenses. These requirements are met by various sections of the report, items such as flow rates, wall elevations, adverse samples, monthly, average, and maximum daily flows, and so on. This document is produced in-house every year and includes much more than the requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Contents include non-compliance items, an executive summary, system description, annual production summary and comparisons, permits to take water and municipal drinking water license numbers and expiration dates, sampling procedures and summary of samples taken, MECP compliance inspection reports, all microbiological and chemical sampling certificates of analysis, important daily data collected throughout the year, and meter calibration records. Over the course of the last 20 years, the governance of public water systems in the province of Ontario has seen many changes. And much like a good quality management system, amendments to the Safe Drinking Water Act and other related legislation continue to occur. This presentation hopes to highlight the means and methods by which the Water Division ensures that all requirements are met on a daily, monthly, and yearly basis, starting with the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks interactions, DWQMS audits, and communication requirements. Every year, as a means of ensuring compliance with the applicable regulations that affect public drinking water, an inspector from the MECP performs an on-site inspection. These are either announced or unannounced inspections. We typically go through focused inspections because of an exceptional compliance history. However, every three years, we are required to undergo a detailed inspection. Inspectors review logbooks, sampling results, maintenance tasks, and ensure all information required by the Safe Drinking Water Act is available. They'll ensure compliance by reviewing operations and maintenance manuals, procedures, licenses, documentation, and record control. The MECP inspection highlights include an inspection rating of 100% for the past several years using the MECP's current rating system, an excellent rapport with the MECP and Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit inspectors, all working together to provide safe drinking water. We're consistently meeting sampling and testing requirements. We have an established record of implementing best management practices. To comply with the newest requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Water Division has developed our own internal quality management system. To maintain our accreditation to the Drinking Water Quality Management Standard, both an internal and external audit are completed on an annual basis. Internal audits are completed by internal staff or third parties trained drinking water quality management standard persons. And external audits are completed by NSF International. The potential outcomes from each audit are major and minor non-conformances, opportunities for improvements, and observations. 
To date, we've addressed and closed numerous non-conformances and opportunities for improvement, indicating system strengthening and growth. There are usually improvements that can be found in any quality management system. We've satisfied all requirements to achieve full accreditation to the drinking water quality management standard. In order to satisfy requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act, we've implemented a communications policy that clarifies how information is conveyed to the owners. QMS information communicated to owner representative. The owner representative provides information to council via committee of the whole. Minutes of QMS management review meetings also provided to council at regular council meetings on a quarterly basis. And queries from owners are circulated back to the management team via QMS top management. QMS information includes management review meetings, internal and external audit reports, circulation of the operational plan to the owner representative through our compliance science program and through the annual summer reports. This concludes my brief presentation to Council regarding the governance of the Water Division operations. I will now gladly answer any questions that you may have. Okay, Sarah, if you would uh, release the screen, please. Thank you. So with that, members of Council, does anyone have any questions through the mode? Councillor Cinema. Thanks very much, Mo. I, I don't have any real questions. I just want to thank you very much for providing that um, that report. It just helps make all of the information that we received earlier much clearer. So I really do appreciate it. You're welcome. Any further questions? Uh, Councillor Budabaker. Thank you, Worship. Uh, good presentation, Mo. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, I just have one question with respect to capacity. How are we with respect to capacity, both current and future? Uh, we're in really good shape uh, capacity-wise, and I have uh, most of uh, council to, sitting on there now to thank for that because uh, the meters have um, really, really done a, a super job in, in keeping us, uh, keeping us uh, you know, in a really good uh, capacity situation for water and in turn for wastewater as well with the expansion of the wastewater treatment plant um we have we can we've got 40 years to go before we start reaching it uh, we'll see how that turns out with uh future growth because it, it seems to be accelerating at this point and we're just uh undergoing our secondary source uh of supply um um study and we're going to take into account those kinds of numbers and see where we're at. Um, but for the near future, and uh, I would say 20, 25 years, we're, we're in really good shape. Just depends on, um, you know, we, if we start getting industry in town, that uh, we'll have to have a look at it in 10, 15 years. But um, that's where we, we lost out as well on, on a lot of consumption. Uh, was due to some loss of of, um, of industry over the years, but the meters have done a phenomenal job into um, extending our capacity. Thanks, Mo. Hey, uh, Councilor Cummings. Thank you, Worship. Great presentation, Mo. Question for you regarding the Robert Street well. I know there's going to be testing going on. Is there any possibility in the future that we're looking at putting that? Uh, well back on stream or is it a lost cause? Well, we'll see what the study what this uh, what this next flow test uh, indicates, but I, I think I'm pretty positive about being able to use those somewhere down the road. Uh, the last time we tested it, we averaged out about 27 micrograms per liter. Um, <clears throat> and we suspect it's going to be much lower than that now. We still have a ways to go. There's still the possibility of doing treatment down there, but we also want to do double the capacity of flow testing that we did last time because we really want to see if there's something else that might be pulled in um, another plume of some other nastiness that we don't know about at this point um, that would maybe be the the end of that you know that a dream of getting those wells up and running again and 
also running it at uh, double the capacity that we did before, we'll be able to see what the hydraulic capacity is and whether it could handle um, satisfying the needs as a secondary source, but it certainly wouldn't hurt to have it online um, going forward in the future, regardless of what we find with the secondary source of supply. If you, if you recall many years ago, we talked about an aeration tower, or is there still possibility of that happening or? Uh, it's a different method we'd be looking at, but it, again, we'll have to see where we're at with the TCE and possibly anything else that comes in down the, down the line that we don't know about. But uh, it wouldn't be a packed tower aeration, so we wouldn't be looking at that big silo. We'd be looking at other means of, of treatment. Okay. Councillor LaRose, you had your card up. Yes, I did. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, my question was asked and answered. Uh, it was all about Robert Street West and our secondary water system. But uh, other than that, good job, Mo. Okay. Further questions through to Mo? Okay, there being none. Again, as usual, Mo, very good presentation and well informed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Okay, with that then, that concludes our presentations and we can move on to five, which is our council information package. And uh, I would ask for a mover and a seconder. And the recommended action is that the council information packages dated April 24, 21 and May 12, 2021 haven't been given due consideration, be received for information. A mover and a seconder. Councillor Cummings and Councillor Levy, does anyone wish to have anything pulled from the SIP? There being none, all at oh, Councillor Sainama. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the only, what I would like to have pulled um, for future or for some discussion or to look at is the letter. Um, it was in the, it's number 2A, um, that budget request regarding the three street intersection to look at the three street intersection at Dufferin, Robert and uh, Burke to look at that um, as part of the, that development request that had gone forward earlier. Okay. And that back through the planning, thank you. If there's nothing more, um, I'll call for the vote, all in favor. And it's scary, thank you. And that then will move us on to section A, transportation environmental services and I'll pass it to Councillor Clue. Thank you, Your Worship. So on our consent agenda tonight, there are two items, the Transit Committee meeting minutes of December 15th, 2021, and the Midland Penetanguishene Transit Ridership Quarterly Update for Q1 2021. The recommended action is that the following consent agenda items having been given due consideration be received for information. Do I have a mover? Councillor Rose, a seconder, Councillor Sanema. Is there any questions, anything to pull here? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried, thank you. Under matters for consideration, the first item tonight is the award of tender 2021-08, supply delivery and placement of asphalt, report RDS 2021-11. The recommended action is that the town of Penetanguishene enter into a one-year contract with G&J Paving to supply, deliver, and carry out the placement of asphalt, and that signatures of approval are granted from the clerk and mayor on the contractual document and that staff bring forward a bylaw for the agreement for council approval. Can I have a mover for this item? Councillor Rose, a seconder, Deputy Mayor. Any questions, comments? I see none, all in favor? Thank you, that's carried. The second item is drainage easement at 259 Champlain Road, report RDS 2021-13. The recommended action is that council approve option two as outlined with the staff and that staff bring forward an easement agreement and bylaw for council approval. Uh, council may recall a similar item was dealt with on the neighboring property, um, but we can have some discussion. Do we have a mover for this item? Councillor Rose, a seconder. Councillor Sainama, any questions or comments? I'm seeing none, all in favor? 
That is carried, thank you. The next item is the Roads Division Winter Operations, a two shift system day and night shift update report, report RDS 2021-12. The recommended action is that council approve the continued use of the two shift system within the Roads Division during the 2021-2022 winter season. And that staff provide forward a summary report of the two shift system for council's review in the spring 2022. Is there a mover for this? Councillor LaRose, a seconder, Councillor Levy. Any questions? Any comments? Good, the report has been read. All in favor? Thank you, that is carried. And finally, moving on to referrals this evening for t &E, that the Transportation and Environmental Services section endorsed the following additional and existing referrals to upcoming agendas and staff. We still have two items on the list, Church Street parking and accessible transit options. Do we have a mover for this? Councillor Rose, a seconder. Councillor Cummings, are there any comments, questions, anything to add or change on this list? I see none. All in favor? That is carried as well. Thank you so much. And we're at question period from media and public. I don't believe we have any, so I'll turn it back to you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Blue. And with that, we'll move on to seven, Section D, the Recreation and Community Services. And I turn it over to Councillor Cummings. Thank you, Your Worship. On our consent agenda tonight, we have two items. The first one is the minutes dealing with the Community Wellbeing Committee dated uh, February the 4th. Uh, we have minutes from the Museum and Heritage Committee dated March 11th, and the Trails Advisory Committee minutes dated March 2nd. Do I have a mover? The, well, I guess I better read the recommended action first of all, that the following consent agenda items having been given due consideration be received for information. And the first one is the minutes. Do I have a mover? Councillor Rose, seconder. Councillor Sanama, question from Deputy Mayor. You're muted, Deputy Mayor. You have two items of consent. The second one was the Winterama report. Yeah, we're dealing, yeah, okay. Can we deal with that separately? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I can I can give some guidance on that, Councillor Cummings. If, if please, you, um, yeah. So the idea for consent is is to uh, pass everything listed under that item in one quick motion. And of course, unless there's a, an item that needs to be discussed. so, uh, they uh, are they are to be voted on as as a group. Absolutely. Okay. Um, second one is Winterama, the post event report, uh, RCS 2021-11. Uh, it's the post report. Forward drama. So now, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to comment. Uh, I think Winterama, despite COVID 19, went off very well. There were a lot of different things that were tried and were very successful. I want to uh, thank the Recreation Department and Marla. Uh, for all the work that they put into this and certainly for the application of funding. So we did receive half of the dollar spent. So that's good news. And hopefully uh, what savings there was or will be that we can put it toward our expenses for 2022. And hopefully we'll be in a position to have a real big party with COVID behind us. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. You uh, stole my thunder. I was going to say that. However, you said it before me. So we have a mover of uh, Councillor Rose, seconder of Councillor Sanema. Uh, any other questions or concerns? All in favor? Carried, thank you. Um, item B, matters for consideration. We have none. And item C is referrals to upcoming agendas. Uh, that the Recreation and Community Services section endorse the following additional and existing referrals to the upcoming agendas and staff. Uh, we have the outsourcing of the day camps. Are there any, uh, want, anybody want to add or delete from this list? Seeing none, I need a mover for it. Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Tubo, seconder, Councillor Sanama. 
Any other questions? All in favor? Carried, thank you. Uh, questions from the media and the public? I don't see any. Back to you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councilor Cummings. We move on to eight, Section C, Planning and Community Development Services, and I will pass it to Councilor Levy. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Hoping my phone cooperates. Hold on. Okay. Uh, we'll start with the consent agenda, recommended action that the following consent agenda items have been given due consideration to be received for information. We have Huronia Animal Control Monthly Comparative Report 2021. We have Municipal Law Enforcement Monthly Activity Report April 2021. Memo to Council Re Municipal Sales Update uh, May 1st, 2021. We have Memo to Council Re Business Recovery Task Force Meeting Number 11. Memo to Council Re Complete Application for Zoning Bylaw File Number. ZA4 2021-39 Yo Street. Memo to Council Re Cloud Permit, Penetanguishing's new online booking tool. Memo to Council Queens Court Appeals Update, 221 Fox Street. Memo to Council Re Sim County of Simcoe Municipal Comprehensive Review, May 1, 2021. Business support efforts, May 2021, support for federal and provincial economic investments in priorities to build resilience for Severn Sound watershed, municipalities, and coastal communities, April 2021. Uh, does anyone want any of these pulled for discussion? Okay, oh, there's Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to pull the uh, Severn Sound shoreline resilience. There is a, um, a resolution, I guess it was part of the information and I would like uh, council to consider supporting that separately. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Mayor and uh, Vice Chair, Councillor Vadavankor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I don't want to pull any items. I just want to comment on two, so I'll be very quick. The first item I want to comment on is just with respect to the report on the land sales. Uh, the municipality did very, very well in the land sales, much better than projected. So kudos to everybody involved in that. And the second comment has to do with the report on the municipal comprehensive review, a uh, significant project that's being undertaken by the county um, I appreciate our planning staff bringing forward this information report. It's something we're going to have to keep our eye on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Vadavankor. Councillor Clue, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I don't believe I want to pull this item. More of a question, perhaps, for staff. We receive these Heronia Animal Control Monthly reports quite often, and I can't help but notice that there's a climbing number of animals at the shelter. I think that's part because in COVID we're seeing a lot of adoptions happening with animals, which is great. But I'm wondering if the town, given that this is a partner of ours, has ever done any promotion of that, the fact that there are these animals available for adoption. And if we haven't, I'd really like us to consider exploring that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Clue. I think that's a fabulous point. And uh, yeah, I think we should pursue that and talk to our friends at, uh, the SPCA and uh, Mr. B Biden and uh, perhaps get staff to follow up on that. I don't know if we need to do that formally or if we can, uh, perhaps Stacy can give us some guidance. Um, I think that um, our director of planning and community development uh, and it speak, I think deals with our animal control uh, contract through our bylaw service. So I think it's something certainly that she could have a conversation and find out what we need to do uh, to, to assist in, in uh, helping communicate that, that initiative for sure. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Does that satisfy you, Councillor Clue? Or did you want something more formalized? Well, thanks, Madam Chair. I think perhaps I'll bring it up at the referral stage and we can go from there. Very good. Thank you very much. 
Now, where am I? Do we, uh, uh, Stacy, again, um, do we approve the initial group of? Uh... So, yeah, um, you have, I think you've read the entire list, and I think uh, you have a mover and a seconder, and uh, everything that was discussed, um, I think, was just, there was comments. I think Deputy Mayor Dubot was the only one that sort of wanted to see an action. Um, and that I think um, is easily done. I, we just received that that um, that letter from the SSCA, so certainly that can go on the next council agenda for us to support. Um, and if she wants to move a motion and, and have a seconder to, to, to make that formalized, um, we can do that through this process. Um, but otherwise, everything else can be received for information. So, sorry, that was clear as mud, Stacy. Mm -hmm. um, do I now check with the deputy mayor and see if she wants to formalize or? <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's up to council if they want to move or move a motion. Um, in this case, they've, you know, everyone's had an, had an opportunity to speak, but certainly it's uh, everyone's own decision whether they want to see, see action happen. Uh, I can imagine that, that staff understand the SSEA and, and, are, and are happy to support it. So I don't, I don't think it's something that's, that's probably not going to happen even outside of Deputy Mayor uh, requesting it, but certainly it's her it's her uh, prerogative to to move that motion. Are you good with that, Madam Deputy Mayor? Yes, I would like to move the motion that we support this initiative from SSEA, and I would hope someone would support this. Seconded by Councillor Clue. Uh, any more discussion? All in favor? Oh, 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 Councillor oh. Cummings. Thank you. Just a question to the deputy mayor. Is this not also being addressed by the Great Lakes Initiative Group? Yes, this request is support for the federal and provincial economic investment to make this a priority to help uh, communities with shoreline development because of the erosion of shorelines in the Great Lakes. But this re resolution is also uh, part of the Great Lakes, um, what do they call that? Uh, yes, the Great Lakes and City Initiatives, yes. I mean, well, this is just giving um, a little more credence, I guess, to the request for funding. Okay. So, all in favor? That is carried, and uh, we haven't voted on the other uh, the other items, I don't believe, but we do have a mover and seconder, so all in favor of the rest of them? And perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, matters for consideration, referral report concerns at 12 Burns Crescent. Planning 2021-24 recommended action that staff report planning 2021-24 be received for information. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Council's had a chance to read this as well as the uh, late edition uh, on desk yesterday or today. Uh, do we have uh, to get it on the table? Do we have a mover? Councillor Mayette, seconded by anybody? <laughs> Councillor LaRose, and uh, does anyone have anything to add to uh, this? Councillor Vadavoncourt. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move that this um, matter be referred back to staff so that they can address the uh, information that was uh, included in that uh, late letter that we just received and they bring it back to the next uh, committee of the whole meeting. Thank you. Sorry, I missed the beginning of that, uh, Councillor Vadavoncourt. Was that a motion? You moved that? Yeah, I was going to move a referral back to staff so that staff could address the uh, the information that we just received in that letter and come mm -hmm. back with a report at the next committee of the whole meeting. And do we have a seconder for Councillor Vadavon Court? Uh, Councillor Cummings, uh, thank you very much. And any more discussion before I call for the vote? No discussion, all in favor? Opposed? Uh, Madam Chair, the clerk had her hand up. Oh, what did I do wrong now? <laughs>
Well, um, you did have a mover and a seconder for the original motion on the floor. Um, so I understand what Council of Vandalcourt is looking to do. However, you do have um, two members of Council have moved the other uh, direction. Um, so whether or not Council wants to vote um, on what is on the floor and defeat it, and then Council of Vandalcourt make his uh, motion, or whether the two people that have moved and seconded want to withdraw, uh, those are the options on the floor. Okay, so we can do this in a friendly manner by just asking if the mover and the seconder, that was, who was that, Councillor LaRose? I have. And Councillor Mayette. Yes, LaRose and Mayette. Okay, guys, want to chime in here? <clears throat> They, they, they has indicated that he will we, uh, we can take it off the table absolutely yes. and all we need to do is put it on the referrals at the end well no we can we as long as you're both willing to to remove your moving and seconding we yeah. can go back to councillor vetabancourt's motion and um and then that just gets referred back to staff it doesn't need to be added to the referral items list it's fine sure okay Great. So, do we did we have a seconder for Councillor Vadovankor's motion, which is now up? Councillor Cummings, thank you very much. All those in favor? Perfect. That is carried. Thank you very much. Okay. Next up is the draft town dock secondary plan and master plan. Recommended action that this report be received for information and discussion and that direction be given to any changes to the draft secondary plan and master plan and further that Council of the Corporation of Town of Penetanguishing formally com commence an official plan amendment OPA 2021-01 for the town doc future study. Hmm. Okie dokie. Hmm. Uh, to get this on the table, do we have a mover? Councillor Cummings, stop smiling. Uh, seconded by Councillor Vadavancourt. And discussion, please. Oh, no discussion. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Councillor LaRose. Lots of discussion. Councillor LaRose? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, what's the deal with uh, making an official plan amendment. What does that do or not do for us? I would ask uh, our planner, Ms. Betty, to respond. Yes, thank you very much uh, through you, Madam Chair, to Councillor LaRose. So um, under our official plan currently, this is a future study area and the policies of our official plan require that we go through a process of some sort to at least uh, identify and make sure that we've examined the reasons why we um, need that uh, that you know layer of development or vision master planning exercise. So the official plan amendment actually then brings the policies into the official plan, and in essence would then execute that official plan or give us the the direction to how to apply policies about land use change or land use development to the town dock area. Um, so until the official plan amendments passed to actually execute the town dock master plan. It really is just a, a document that could um, sit on the shelf for lack of a better word until it gets uh, implemented. Thank you, Madam Planner. Any other questions, comments? Do I have a mover? Oh, look, I don't have a mover. Oh, Councillor Cummings. You, you already have a mover, um, oh. Madam Chair. Oh. Okay, it was Councillor Cummings and? Uh, Councillor Vadboncourt. Great, okay. Uh, all in favor? One, two. Okay, it is carried. Thank you very much. County of Simcoe Economic Development Funding Program 2021 recommended action that council approve an application to the County of Simcoe's 2021 Economic Development Funding Program 
for phase two of the town dock secondary plan being option number one in staff report planning 2021-31 for $50,000. <clears throat> Do I have a mover? Deputy Mayor Dubo, seconded by Councillor Vadavancourt. Is there any discussion on this? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Thank you very much. That is carried. Land use compatibility assessment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Harbor Point subdivision file number pen sub 202001. Uh, Plan 2021-33. Oops, oh dear. Someone might have to help me out here. My phone just did something awful. Okay, Councilor Vadavancor, could you take this over for me, please? Or Stacy? Yep, I think Councilor Vadavancor has it, but he's just on mute. Yep, just had a second here just to uh sorry about that no problem i just uh was just reading something there so Jeez. we're at the um brad item um, item four on the development services section the land use compatibility assessment harbor port harbor point subdivision and uh we have uh, a uh, report uh, from staff dealing with uh, peer review uh, from um, Luca um, land use uh, compatibility uh, report and uh, a couple of letters and uh, restrictive covenants. Councilor Vadavancourt, you're cutting out. Yes. Every or time part. you turn, every time you turn your head, you cut out. Oh, okay. Sorry, it's hard. I got I got the agenda on one screen, and I'm I've got our computer here. So perhaps Stacy could read. Perhaps Stacy could read. It. Certainly, happy to help. So it's the land use compatibility assessment, Harbor Point subdivision, file number ten sub twenty twenty dash oh one, and it's the planner's report twenty twenty one dash thirty three. Uh, what isn't noted here on the agenda is that this, this is to be re received for information. So my apologies for that. It's not showing up on what you're seeing, um, which might be why Councillor Levy was having uh, having an issue. But uh, the motion is that it be received for information. And Madam Chair can call for movers to continue, continue on from here, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh... Stacy, um, so do I have a mover for this? Oh. Councillor Vadabancourt, seconded by Councillor Mayette. Is there any discussion to uh, the recommendation that we've received for information? Councillor Vadabancourt. So in, uh, in reviewing the report um, prior to the meeting, you can see that um, there is a potential issue with the uh, rock crusher and where the rock crusher is located um, at the at the pit. And so, from that standpoint, um, I inquired at our section meeting whether uh, Pen and Tank Sand and Gravel had been consulted uh, with respect to what was coming forward. Uh, this thing, and I was advised that they that they were. My understanding is is that the location of the um, the crusher can be moved uh, on site to a location that potentially um, muffles uh, the noise somewhat. In addition to that, um, the period of time that there is this crusher operating is about 20 days. And so um, the impact um, potentially is minimal uh, over a full year. And the final thing was that's noted in the report and it's something I think we asked for um, back when we were considering the subdivision it, that there's uh, restrictive covenants in the, um, in the, in the um, 
subdivision agreement that passed on to the owners dealing with um, the advising them that there is potential for noise uh, from the adjacent uh, um, the adjacent operation and that uh, they um, should not be complaining about the, about the noise that they're they're moving in or buying these homes with full full information full disclosure so from that standpoint you know I, I think there's uh, mechanisms there to ensure that everyone is satisfied I just wasn't sure um, with respect to any comments from uh, Pantang Sand and Gravel because I did not have an opportunity to reach out to them nor did they contact me to uh, advise me of any concerns that they might have Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much, Councillor Vadabuncor. Uh, Councillor Cummings. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. We received a letter this afternoon. I'm not sure whether everyone has had a chance to read it or not, but it was on desk. Um, I think we need to take a look at this um, in viewing the peer results uh, and the letter that we received this afternoon, I think we need to investigate a little bit more. Uh, uh, to your point, uh, Councillor Vadimankor, they seem to have some different opinions on it. They certainly do, Councillor Cummings. Um, I did read the letter. Uh, I still have some serious concerns about the um, compatibility between the residential property and a longstanding uh, aggregate business. And uh, quite frankly, I'm a little stumped as to where to go from here. Uh, I'd like to hear any other comments uh, or questions from Council. And I'd also like perhaps Councillor Vadabuncor for you to clarify where you think we go next if you've had a chance to read the letter. Uh, in fact, I have not, so. Okay. It's from Dale uh, Lettyard, representing the Lettyard family. He's a lawyer. We've met him before in council. And uh, it, it raises some points that uh, are of great interest to me. And. Um, Madam Chair, if I might, I think possibly, I think what the best solution for this evening is to refer it back to, to staff for another further review and report to, to council. I think you're absolutely correct, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the letter was late in coming. Uh, it came this afternoon, um, but uh, it, it's basically the same old, same old with this. These are incompatible uh, land uses. Um, and uh, we, I don't know if we can ever satisfy both parties, but uh, after reading this letter, I think we have to give it much more thought and consideration. Uh, as much as we like the new development, uh, uh, we do have to respect a long, long time business in our community. And uh, so given that, I would say that we delay any further decisions on this and uh, get some more information and uh, and I would hope that it doesn't take too long to uh, clarify some of the points. So having said that, I've, oh, Councillor Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I don't know whether we have a mover and seconder for this motion, yes. but if we don't, I'd like to move that we, we send it back to staff to, uh, for them to report on, on the, uh, both the review and the letter. <coughs> Sorry. Do we have a seconder? We have a mover and a seconder for the original motion again. We're in, uh, the, same, yeah. we're in the same position we were in earlier. And that would be? It was uh, Councillor uh, Vadabancourt and Councillor Mayant. Councillor Vadabancourt. I will withdraw that earlier motion, Madam Chair. I will withdraw also. Thank you very much. That motion has been withdrawn. Um, now I need a mover to uh, send this back to staff for further clarification and discussion and to bring us back a report. 
Councillor Cummings, thank you. Councillor Vettabuncourt? Oh, yes, he seconded it. Uh, okay, all in favor. Wonderful, thank you very much. And since I still don't have my agenda in front of me, Councillor Vettabuncourt? Or Stacy. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the next item on the agenda was the referrals, and there are uh, three uh, referrals on the on the list. Uh, referral dealing with the uh, uh, graffiti policy, the MLEO policy and procedure review, and the Burns Crescent bylaw concerns. And maybe the clerk can help me. Um, with the first two, I thought that maybe we had already dealt with the first two. I know the the last one we just referred that back. And while she's um, there, she is. Uh, are there any new referrals that anybody had? Okay, so um, Councillor Mayotte, um, before I go to you, Councillor Mayotte, I just asked the clerk for clarification on those two items, whether they've already been dealt with or they're properly uh, still remaining on the referral list. Um, they, are, they are remaining there. So if we could have a, a mover and a second to, to remove both of them, that would be ideal. Um, and then we could move on to the to the new item from Councillor Maya. Okay, so may I have a mover and uh, Councillor Levy and a seconder to take those two items off. Uh, Councillor Sanama, that's the graffiti policy and the MLEO policy and procedure review. Any further comments, all those in favor? Any opposed, seeing none, motion carries. And then uh, Councillor Matt, I believe you had an item that you wanted to suggest be added. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just the one thing I'd like to add to the, the agenda is maybe if we can have staff on the next meeting, give us a update on the 59 Main Street. Uh, um, a lot of people are asking questions, what's going on? And uh, nobody seems to have an answer, so staff, or the CAO or somebody like that can give us an update on that. It could be the next meeting. It doesn't have necessarily to be tonight, but I'd like to get a, an update so the public will also know about 59 Main Street. Okay, you. thank you. So you'll move that. Uh, do we have a seconder for that referral item? Uh, Councilor Rose, any further discussion on that? All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none. Thank you. The motion carries. So we've got the one item added. The other one remains. Uh, Your Worship, uh, I'll turn it back to you. Um, the last item before that was question period from the media and the public, and I don't believe we have sorry, any. Sorry, Councillor Vettabancor. I think uh, Councillor Clue had wanted to add uh, the, uh, yeah, something to do with the pets and oh. adoption. Oh, Thank pardon you. me. That's on this one. Sorry, Councillor Clue. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair. <laughs> um, if we could just add the... Um, perhaps partnership or communications with the Hironi Animal Control to showcase or distribute information about available pets. No, no deadline, just uh, something we should be perhaps sharing with the community. Excellent, thank you. Um, you're gonna move that. Do we have a seconder for that motion? Uh, Councillor Sanama, any further discussion? All those in favor? Carried. So before I go to the media and the public, any other referrals? Did I capture them all there? Okay, so uh, question period for the media and the public. I uh, don't see any, so your worship, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Wedemokar. And with that, I will pass it on to Finance and Corporate Services and uh, pass it on to Councillor Sanima. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, under our consent agenda for the finance and corporate services, we have a, mem a memo to council um, regarding the community safety and well being plan. Update uh, number three it's attachment of the draft plan to be posted. Uh, we have a <laughs> the attachment has been posted. Um, also, a memo to council read the CAO 2021 um, regarding the CNCC policing costs. And those are the two items we recommend action is that the following consent agenda items having been given due consideration be received for information. If I could have a mover, please. Councillor Mayotte and a seconder. 
Councillor LaRose. Any questions, any concerns? Seeing none, could we have a vote? All those in favor? So moved, thank you. Um, matters for consideration. The facility use agreement, uh, the vaccination clinic at Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit and the Town of Pendant and Hanguishine, uh, FES 2021-03. The recommended action that council approves the agreement between the town of Penetanguishene and the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit for the use of a vaccination clinic and that the clerk be authorized to bring forward the necessary bylaw for approval. If I could have a mover to bring this forward, please. Councillor Mayotte, seconder, Deputy, Deputy Mayor Dubo. Um, everyone's had a chance to read the agreement quite comfortable with it. Any discussion? Oh, Councillor Mayotte. Go ahead, unmute. Thank you, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just basically a comment. Um, like I know most of you probably already had your vaccination. I got mine on the Tuesday and it was great to see those people. They worked like an assembly line, they were polite, they were ready. Um, like, you know, you're there half an hour, didn't even seem like half an hour. So congratulations to the team, Paul, congratulations, but stuff up and Roy and all that. It was great. And keep up the good work, guys. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Councillor Mayotte. Uh, Deputy Mayor Dubel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just as uh, Chair of the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit Board, I certainly would like to thank the town of Penetang Machine for their effort. Things have worked really well. And I know that uh, the health unit is uh, very pleased with the effort that's been made by our staff. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Yes, it's, it's, it's a, it is a feather in our cap, having certainly having that facility there. And thank you very much to, uh, to, the, to, to Paul and the staff at the arena as well. Okay, so I do need a vote. Everyone's in favor. Um, very good. No, none opposed. And that motion is passed. The next item um, for consideration is the future of 51 Dunlop Street, former Penetanguishene Secondary School. Uh, report CAO 2021-07. Whereas council recognizes the former secondary school known as PSS has significant sentimental value and emotional attachments for members of the community. Whereas the former secondary school building has a substantial amount of asbestos containing materials within it. Whereas the building requires a substantial amount of operating and capital dollars over the short, medium and long terms to sit vacant and bring the building to appropriate standards. Be it resolved that the council supports option number one in report CAO 2021-07 to proceed with demolition and asbestos abatement in an ex expedient manner. And that the council directs administration to explore and pursue avenues to provide members of the community with opportunities to own various chattels currently included within that building. And that the council directs administration to proceed with a thorough and comprehensive community consultation and engagement strategy with respect to the future, future potential uses of the vacant property. And finally, that the decision regarding option number one be brought to special counsel on May the 26th, 2021 for ratification to expedi expedite the process, minimize costs and reduce liabilities. Do I have a mover for that motion? Uh, Councillor Mayotte and a seconder, Councillor Cummings. Discussion? Any clarification? Councillor Vadimankler. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. It's a question for the clerk. Um, the, the motion reads um, council all the way through and I'm not familiar with the town's process um, or procedure. We're in committee of the whole here and it makes reference to, to council. I just wanna understand um, the nuances here versus um, what I'm reading. And I apologize for not catching this earlier, but 
Um, the, the intent is that whatever we deal with tonight will go to this the special meeting on the 26th. And I want to understand this is a committee and that next meeting is the actual council meeting. So any assistance you can provide would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, definitely a uh, very good question. This is a bit of a unique um, circumstance with this report because we are uh, requesting to bring it to the May 26th meeting, which is a little unusual when we have something on committee of the whole. So that's why the, the motion is structured in the way that it is. It's, it's so that council has a full understanding of what's being recommended, but also that's that last section just showing that we are bringing it forward uh, to the May 26th meeting. It won't be in our normal process way of, of our committee of the whole report where we pass everything by consent. Um, and it won't be in that same in that same normal um, process that we do. So that's why it does seem a little unusual. It will be its own separate motion again, uh, basically reiterating what what you're seeing today, um, minus that sort of that ratification piece at the bottom, just to give council the full opportunity to recommend it from finance and corporate services today, and then again finally approve it on May 26th. Um, again, it's, a, it's something we don't normally do, so I understand that it might, it might sound not flow as normally uh, as smooth as we, we have here, but hopefully that explanation at least gives some understanding of, of our thought process and, and the process going forward. Thank you. Any further discussion? CAO, please. Thanks, Madam Chair. Just in an effort to be uh, to to be full disclosure, one of the things that's not incorporated in the report um, is the potential for our fire department. The fire department has requested a potential opportunity opportunity to do some training in the in the building um, around rescue and and or recovery. They they don't often get this opportunity, quite frankly, with a building of this magnitude. Um, so that may be something that we're looking to pursue. Um, you know, of course, nothing will be finalized until council solidifies uh, an option, but certainly um, to some extent or another, and it may vary depending on the, the final option that council endorses on May 26th, um, but certainly there's a real opportunity for our volunteer fire to do some uh, rescue and recovery training in that facility and I did just want to be open and transparent with with committee uh, that that may be something that we explore you know in the coming months uh, of course uh, after possession after the deal closes but potentially before anything material happens with the building uh, thank you madam chair thank you for that extra information um okay so no further discussion uh, we have a mover and a, oh, Councillor Clue. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to be honest that I'm really struggling with this one. And uh, it's, it's, not, it's not an easy decision for me to make at this point. I feel like we're rushing it. And so I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm prepared to vote in favor of this tonight. I feel like we need more information from the community still. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not feeling it yet. It's my honest opinion. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Clue. Um, we do have the motion on the floor. Um, we have had a, uh, a motion and a seconder. Um, we will bring it to a vote and, and then to look at it to being ratified on the 26th for further discussion, I suppose. Um, all those in favor? Well, yes, I move it forward. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, those opposed, if we can record that, um, but it has been passed. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, going forward, referrals to upcoming agendas and to the staff, uh, referrals at the Finance and Corporate Services section endorse the following additional and existing referrals to upcoming agendas and staff. Uh, the Heronia Airport Commission roadmap update is um, on this, on the referral list as well. 
anything to be out. Okay, sorry, a mover and a seconder. Uh, Councillor Cummings moved, Councillor LaRoe was second. Um, did I see Councillor Mayotte? Did you ever, did you want to speak? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't know if this falls under this, our section of finance. Something I'd like to add on is I'm looking at the, uh, what lately like our presentation delegation that we have at our meetings, three or four per meeting. And if I remember correctly, it's not this council. It was the last council with uh, Mr. Marshall. I don't know if we had passed a motion or is it the, the part of our policy that only two presentation per meetings per night. I don't know if the staff can look into it. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, um, but these uh, delegations are getting much longer and you have three or four. Uh, um, that I can, I'd like to put that on the referrals so council can give me the answer or let me know. I don't know if it falls under uh, um, finance, but uh, if we can add it, I'd like to add it, please. Stacy. Could you comment, please? Um, I yes, it's it's definitely the right section, Councillor Mayotte. It's uh, finance and corporate services, so this would fall under the procedural bylaw. And I I don't have the procedural bylaw in front of me, and I know I should probably know it off by heart by now. Definitely, um, I don't, but I can definitely check uh, to ensure that it actually is a requirement as our procedural bylaw. And if not, um, certainly we can have, have the discussion about making amendments to the procedural bylaw if, if that's what Uncle's looking for. Um, and if, I don't know if it needs to be a referral item until I, until I make that, that, um, that check into the, into the procedural bylaw, but that's up to you. Whatever possible way, just, I'd like to know, like I say, I thought we had passed that five, six years ago, but I'd like to be corrected to, if I'm wrong. Councillor Levy. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I also do recall at the time, uh, I'm not sure if anyone else, if I've got this right, but I do recall at the time, we did put a time limit on uh, 10 minute uh, deputations uh, from individuals and 20 minutes for professional uh, reports and deputations. So, uh, if uh, the clerk could add that to the request list, I would appreciate it. Um, and while we're on this discussion, I, I mean, I, I believe part of it is because we are only holding like one council meeting a month as opposed to every other week, the way we, that the way it was before. Um, I don't know if we wanna bring that forward to look at that as another consideration, even though we are meeting virtually because it is an awful lot of information that we're trying to absorb in a relatively short period of time. Deputy Mayor. Yes, I would that. I think that uh, there is an awful lot of information and uh, we did meet twice a month and I can't see why we don't go, we give some consideration of going back to that. Um, Councillor Levy. Sorry. There you go. My mute right. button was giving me trouble. Um, yeah, I, I agree um, that we should consider it, uh, perhaps not all the time and especially as we're heading into summer um we usually do only do you know once a month maximum but i think uh staff should look at an as needed basis and if they see a meeting's getting too top heavy uh it depends on the issues of course tonight was a heavy one uh, we managed to do it in a fairly timely manner but uh we we want to give these important items, absolute, complete due consideration. And if it means an extra meeting, or if it means, you know, a, a couple of shorter meetings, then I, I would certainly consider that. But I think it's important that we look at that now after uh, 15 months of uh, this new schedule of ours, 
if, if we're needed, we're needed. We're, it's not like we're going out dancing, folks. You know, we can, we, we can show up at seven and do an hour or an hour and a half. And uh, that way we're not insulting uh, residents or consultants who want to uh, present to us. But when there's some heavy lifting, we, we are, can absolutely focus. So that's my say. Good. Okay. Um, Stacy, just for clarification. Sorry. Is that something that needs to be added to the agenda or is it something that staff can discuss and get report back? I know that they are, you know, there's special meetings that are being called periodically. But, and looks like Jeff would, might want to chime in as well. Yes, certainly. Sorry. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I think definitely I can take a look at the procedural bylaw. We did amend it slightly based on the COVID circumstances and based on the fact that we're, we're now participating on Zoom. Um, certainly, I, I do know for a fact that the, the time limits are in there, so I can confirm that. I just don't know if the number of presentations are for sure in there, so I'll look that up. Um, but I think um, our, our CAO is probably going to comment as well, but I think we're hearing members of council loud and clear and uh, certainly going to attempt to reduce that as much as possible and, and fall, fall in line with the procedural bylaws as, as much as possible. Thank you. CAO, any comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to, uh, similar to the clerk's comments, this has certainly been a conversation that we've had internally. The clerk and I have had a few conversations about this uh, fairly recently. I, I don't think there's a maximum in our procedure bylaw, and I just quickly took an opportunity to, to look. But certainly our goal is to, to Councillor Mayotte's point, on occasion we, you know, we've had the third one that, uh, you know, we've, you know, we've not, not wanted to delay. Um, certainly the time limits are in there, as the clerk identified. I think it's a great opportunity, as has been suggested, to report back. And as Councillor Levy identified, we've been in this 15 months. So, you know, is there opportunity to report back? The, the one thing I would say is we we are really taking an opportunity to leverage special meetings. And, and I think Council probably recognizes that. Uh, we had one on the 21st of April, for example. Uh, we have one coming up on May 26th. And really trying, you know, with the goal there, you know, if A, if there's items that can't wait, if, if they really are a priority, uh, and or an attempt to not make an agenda super, super heavy. Uh, and then, of course, the other component that we've always uh, leveraged is in an effort to not hold up development. If there's planning matters that are really critical, we, of course, don't want to hold up development if we can help it. So uh, a, a great opportunity. I, I would suggest it, it's perfect the timing in terms of staff reporting back to the council and we can provide some you know, some staff perspectives and, and a recommendation and, and, and committee through council can, uh, can entertain, the, entertain that referral report. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so Steve, <laughs> just sorry. So sorry, did, yeah, clear, clear did, as did we add it? <laughs> yeah, exactly, clear did we added. add it or no? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Based on the conversation, I think it's a good idea. We can add it as a referral item and uh, I, will, I can bring back a, a, a report, certainly. Thank you very much. Okay, I, if can I, as chair, make the motion and then get someone to second it, or do we ask? Okay, so I'm going to make the motion that we add, um, looking at our meetings and looking at the uh, number of presentations that are allowed, and get staff to report back to us. That sounds okay. great. What, uh, what I'm going to call it is a procedural bylaw review uh, related to presentations and. Um, because it is, it, it is really all about the procedural bylaw, um, uh, the allowance. The timing too, like. Yep. Okay. That'd be great. And do I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Mayotte, all those in favor? Thank you. Um, and, okay. I think we're good with that. Um, question period from the media and public. Seeing none. I will turn it back to you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Simmons. And I must say, uh, with uh, the uh, number of presentations we had and, and the items that we've had to deal with, uh, that all in all, it's uh, not all that bad. Uh, mm. However, uh, 
uh, we've been known to have shorter meetings. So with that, uh, I, I hope that you'll find some little bit of a time to enjoy a bit of, uh, of the evening. If not, good day tomorrow and the rest of the week. Take care.